believe it. Are you ready? Right. This is in the last meeting that is there. Hey. Yeah, allocation to the town. Louisa's town. Okay. We're going to go ahead and call to order the uh, Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission meeting for Thursday, May 2nd. And can we begin with a roll call? Commissioner Lowe? Here. Commission Alternate Story? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Randy Johnson? Commissioner Alternate Hearst? Here. Commissioner Caput? Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Here. Commissioner Friend? Here. Commissioner Leopold? Here. Commissioner Alternate Virginia Johnson? Here. Commissioner Gonzalez? Here. Commissioner Bottorf? Here. And Commissioner Rothkin? Here. Okay. We'll proceed to oral communications. These are items that are not listed on agenda. You will be allowed three minutes to speak on those items. Anybody would like to come up, uh, now would be the time. Hi, Brian Peoples with Trail Now. You know, it's good to have the Transportation Commission meeting here in Capitola. And I want to remind you, right behind us is the essentially the road that is closed, the Capitola the Coastal Corridor, the 32-mile corridor that's very valuable to our community. And it's closed. And it's closed currently because of assumed assumptions made by this organization that were not correct. I went to the March 13th meeting at the California Transportation Commission along with um, your executive director and we talked to the Transportation Committee and we also talked to them after we had meetings with their commissioners and their message was that shouldn't be closed. It's 20 years that it's been sitting that you've been planning this so the corridor is remaining closed. And what we don't realize today is how valuable it is. And I'll give you the example. I live in Aptos, and my wife's a teacher at Valencia Elementary. My house is a half a mile, probably a mile from Valencia. Valencia Road got closed because of the storms. That was a game changer for our community because that main thoroughway was closed. People had to go all the way around. It was a nightmare. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the Coastal Commission, the Coastal Corridor. So for us to accept the idea that we're going to leave it closed for 10 more years, 13 actually, because you're not, unless you're going to spend 15 million for, to support the excursion train, that's closed. It's, the road's closed, you guys. That's a road right here. <coughs> so, the California Transportation Commission told you they were surprised in our conversations with uh, the way that this has been managed, especially when you looked at the Unified Corridor Study. From an engineer's perspective, the train didn't work, bus doesn't, ha neither one of those have the capacity of active transportation. So I want to remind you that you have a road closed through our community. You've, you've, the actions you're doing, 
you've closed that road. And it's very nice that we're here because it's right behind you, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, Peter Stanger, I'm a South County resident. There we go. Um, I just want to recount, on Monday I was with the Santa Cruz County Cycling Club and we started our bike ride over at West Marine and we went along Ohlone, then over uh, to avoid Beach uh, Road. We took the underpass beach uh, along the slough there and then got on the Lee Road where we have no choice but to get onto Beach Road. Going down Beach Road to Clearwater, um, there was a line of uh, eight of us cyclists on the, on the uh, lane and uh, as we were pedaling towards Clearwater, a UPS driver thought it was clear to pass us. And as he was passing us, oncoming traffic started coming and he had no place to go. The oncoming traffic swerved off the road and nearly went into the ditch. I'm just telling you this again today because every time I go on Beach Road, it's just a dismal, dismal experience. Unfortunately, um, when we came up with the Monterey Scenic Sanctuary Trail Plan, at the 11th hour, segment 17 was uh, threatened with the lawsuit and in its wisdom, the Transportation Commission decided on a 17B that was hastily put together by staff, unthinkingly. Um, I would really impose and implore the um, RTC staff to go back and, and the commission to direct them. A much better route, which I'd really like to see implemented soon, is to go along Lee Road, have a pontoon bridge across the slough connecting to Pajaro Valley High School. That could get the kids to the high school. Then to go along Harkin Slough Road, across on another pontoon bridge, the slough, to connect up to where Roundtree um, Sheriff's facility is, and then to Buena Vista. By doing this, it would be a shorter route for cyclists. It would be car free because the cars couldn't get over the pontoon bridge and it would connect South County to North County. I, am, I really would like someone to study this and I would like it to be implemented as soon as possible because it's for the safety of the residents that you're asking to bicycle, but you're not giving us roads to bicycle on. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the commission? Oh, Director Rodkin. Uh, members of the public obviously have every right and uh, I think we all appreciate their uh, ability to share their views of what we ought to do with various situations, but I think it's important that the public know um, accurate information about our relationship with other agencies and I'd like to ask our director, are we in trouble with uh, the, the uh, Transportation Commission over the problem with, our, with the uh, corridor not being built yesterday or tomorrow or something? No, there, there are commissioners on the CTC that are frustrated with the fact that um, we don't have passenger rail service on the line. Um, they've made it very clear that um, they um, provided the Proposition 116 funds for rail service. <coughs> um, the executive director of the CTC um, did confirm that we have met their commitments um, with our um, um, continued um, freight and excursion travel on the line. Um, so w we are not per se in trouble with the Coastal Commission, uh, the, the Transportation Commission, but they are asking for additional information and would like to see us, you know, proceeding with improvements on the line. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Okay, uh, with that, uh, any additions or deletions to the uh, consent or regular agenda? Um, there, the only thing of note is there is a handout for item 27. There are no other changes, additions, or deletions. Okay, great. That brings us to the consent agenda. We usually deal with this all in one motion. Is there anyone on the commission that would like to pull anything from the consent agenda? 
Yes, I think I'd like to pull item 16, please. Okay. We'll uh, move that to, uh, I'm going to move that till after the director's report. Any other items to be pulled? Anybody from the public like to comment on anything on the uh, consent agenda? Any other comments on the consent agenda? Commissioner Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I need to recuse myself from two items on the consent agenda, specifically item 10 and item 29, which deal with the rail corridor. I have a principal residence within 500 feet of the rail corridor, so I have a disqualified for a financial interest for those two items. Great. Thank you for declaring that. Commissioner Rodkin. Just move approval of the consent agenda. As amended, Sec I'll second that. Yeah. Okay. Pulling 16. I was about to say pulling 16. All those in favor? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, on those two items, we recuse. I'm going to vote. All those in favor on on the on the um, motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries with the uh, recusal on items uh, 10 and 29. And let's go to the uh, regular consent agenda. Uh, re regular agenda item now, and it's uh, commissioner reports on related items. I just want to begin with welcoming everybody to the city of Capitola. This rotation as we do these uh, RTC meetings is good for the community as we take an opportunity to visit at least uh, every city one time and uh, it's our honor to have this meeting in, in our humble little abode. So uh, welcome to Capitola. And with that, any other uh, commissioners have comments? Seeing none, we'll move on to the director's report. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Botorf. Um, I have a couple quick announcements. I'm going to keep it pretty short since we have a pretty long agenda. Um, the first one is regarding Highway 9 and complete streets. Uh, on uh, uh, April 18th, uh, Commissioner McPherson and Assemblyman uh, Stone's offices organized a meeting with Caltrans District 5, County Public Works, CHP, and uh, San Lorenzo Valley School District, um, as well as RTC staff and other state and congressional <coughs> representatives to discuss both the near and long term options for addressing pedestrian safety along Highway 9 between Graham Hill Road and the San Lorenzo Valley School Complex in Felton. Caltrans is currently evaluating suggestions made at the meeting and identified through the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley Complete Streets Corridor Plan and RT staff will continue to work with its partners to support implementation of projects um, and public education efforts throughout San Lorenzo Valley, both on short and long-term solutions. Uh, regarding the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission adopted the initial study mitigated negative declaration for phase two of segment seven of the MBSST at its meeting on April 18th. That decision has been appealed to the full city council. A date to hear the appeal has not been set. The City of Santa Cruz announced that the trestle um, um, over San Lorenzo River will open to the public on Friday, May 17th. That's the uh, first delivered, will be the first delivered section of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. The initial planning has started for a ribbon cutting uh, ceremony scheduled to be on uh, Wednesday, May 22nd from 1215 to 1245 under the banner of National Public Works Week. Um, bike to work. Um, May is bike to work month and May 9th is bike to work day. The RTC is a funding partner and sp sponsor of the bike to work event. On May 9th from 6.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. there will be 12 bike to work breakfast sites around the county where bikers will receive free breakfast, coffee, smoothies, and bike maintenance. Some sites will off also offer electric bike test rides and free massages and acupuncture. The RTC will have a booth at the Pacific Avenue site. For more information on Bike to Work Day, please visit the Ecology Action website. Um, Open Streets Watsonville. The RTC is also a sponsor of Open Streets Watsonville, which will be taking place on June 2nd from 11 to 4 p.m. in downtown Watsonville. Open Streets transforms city streets into public parkways where people can enjoy active outdoor recreation in a safe and fun, carefree environment. We will have a booth at this event as well to promote the RTC's programs and projects. I have um, an announcement on Community Bridges, um, provider of Lift Line paratransit dial-a-ride program. They held a ribbon cutting ceremony for two new electric vehicles and charging stations at its fleet facility in Watsonville. The total project cost for the two electric vehicles and the two charging stations was 360,000. 
the California Air Resource Board and California Climate Investment Grant provided 268,000 and 62,000 came from RTC's Measure D. Transition from gas to electric vehicles will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and provide for a more sustainable future. Um, I have a couple staffing changes to announce. I'm sad to announce that Anais Shank, our transportation three, transportation planner three here at the commission, has left the RTC for greener pastures with the county. Uh, Anais will be sorely missed and we wish her the best at the county. We look forward to working with her as she will continue to be heavily involved in transportation planning just across the river. Many of Anise's uh, assignments have been assigned to other staff, including Tommy Travers, who has been provisionally appointed from a planning technician to a planner. Included in his provisional responsibilities, Tommy will replace Anais as the RTC staff lead for the Bicycle Advisory Committee. Um, the June RTC uh, meeting, the regular one, will be held on Thursday, June 6th as planned. As there is no meeting in July and staff anticipates having several items that will need RTC board approval prior to the uh, August 1st meeting, um, we may be uh, scheduling a special meeting for uh, the end of June, likely June 27th after the county completes its budget hearings in July. We will send notifications if a special meeting of the RTC board is scheduled. And that's all I have in my report. Thank you, any questions of the director? I'd just like to uh, congratulate the city on the com coming completion of the San Lorenzo River uh, trestle project. Uh, it was originally going to be opening <coughs> by Memorial Day, and then after the rains, it was, I heard that it was being put off until June. So the fact that it's opening May 17th, I think, is great. It, it's a very greatly needed um, improvement that will uh, encourage people from the east side to get to the the beach area and the boardwalk and it, it was well used when it was really difficult to get across uh, as a four foot walkway and now it's a 10 foot walkway i think it's really going to be appreciated by the uh, people of santa cruz so i just wanted to just emphasize uh, how desirable and important that project the completion of that project is well said any other comments from directors questions uh, from the public, Mr. Peoples. Hi, Brian Peoples, Trail Narrow. Um, great thing about the San Lorenzo Bridge, we recognize that as a, a key milestone for this organization, so good work there. The lift line, that's phenomenal, um, getting those electric vehicles. Great example of rubber-wheeled vehicles utilizing existing infrastructure to help transportation. Those are all good things. Um, one thing I we get concerned about with, though, is showboating. Uh, showboating, especially when you're not really performing to it, and that's the San Lorenzo Bridge. We kind of see that as a showboating. Um, you know, you've owned the corridor 32 miles for, th the CTC said you guys have had it for 20 years. You've been planning it for 20. And you, um, so we kind of see that you're doing that as a showboat, and it's kind of, you know, Great, but, and that's kind of what the, the, the feeling was at the CTC meeting, is that didn't, and, and you think about the, the California Transportation Commission, they're the ones that are giving you money. So if you're going there, tell, you know, not being truthful and, and playing games with the way that you're approaching your policies, not really following engineering requirements, engineering standards, their standards on making your decisions on your infrastructure improvements. It's, it's visible, you guys. I was there, we've been talking to them. So when we say trouble with the CTC, yeah, there's an underlining problem. Your relationship with that, they're following and you're going there telling them, giving them an excursion train plan and they're saying, well, where's your passenger train plan? And they're still waiting for that. They're still waiting for when you're going to give them a date on that. Thank you. Uh, I, if I may, please. Uh, I'm not prone to a point counterpoint with the public, but uh, one thing I've learned serving in public service is that for uh, us policymakers to get anything done, going through the, all the processes and crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's, it's a very difficult thing to do, and any time 
we can accomplish something and get something done. I don't consider it showboating, I consider it progress. So uh, I'm not sure if that's the line you were going down, uh, uh, Commissioner Leopold, but uh, I think that this project in Santa Cruz, as Commissioner Schiffman stated, is something the entire county and this board can be proud of. So with that, sir, go ahead. Uh, Peter Stanger, uh, South County resident. Um, when I was working in Santa Cruz, I went across that uh, wooden uh, bridge many times and on my bicycle and so yeah, I'm happy that it's there. But for those of you that <coughs> evidently can't recognize what's going on here, the um, city of Santa Cruz area, let's see, you've got the Yacht Harbor project that you built out using Monterey's um, Bay Scenic Sanctuary funds. You've got segment seven that you're building out. You've got the planning from Santa Cruz to Davenport that you're planning on now. You've got the Trestle project. Wait a second, what about Mid County? What about South County? What happened to um, even segment 18? That was really an unneeded segment, but that's not getting built yet. And what about when you rebuilt the uh, Trestle in La Selva Beach? Did you put a bike lane on it? Did you, where's the pedestrian supposed to go on San Andreas Road? Well, what sense does that make? Is that very safe? Where are the ways uh, app cars going now instead of Highway 1? They're going along San Andreas Road. Who wants to bicycle? Who wants to walk on San Andreas Road? Unsafe, but you're not giving us alternatives. What happened to a bike lane, a pedestrian lane across La Selva Beach's trestle. What happened to a bike lane or a pedestrian crossing from Sumner to Aptos Village? No, we can go where there's no bike lane underneath the trestles. Unsafe. And where are the ways routing? Right in that same spot. You're leaving the public vulnerable and I think it's shameful. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, Sally Arnold, uh, board chair of Friends of the Rail and Trail. And I just want to congratulate you on the uh, opening of the San Lorenzo Trestle. I'm really impressed it's going to be done by Memorial Day. I had my doubts when that, that uh, deadline was set, but it's excellent. And um, I just want to extend my um, sympathies that um, apparently if you build something, you're in trouble. And if you don't build something, you're in trouble. And um, we d I just want to say that Friends of the Rail and Trail is just really, you know, wa is behind you and wa wants to see all of these infrastructure projects built north to south, making it easier for bicycles, pedestrians, and those people who can do neither and need to maybe roll their wheelchair onto some kind of really convenient high capacity public transportation. And I just want to say, um, you know, I get that it's hard and uh, thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we'll go ahead and close that. Which brings us to item uh, 16. Uh, we're going to, from the consent agenda, this is the uh, approve the fiscal year 2019 Transportation Development Act. And uh, Commissioner Schifrin, your questions on this, please. Yes, I really just had a question for the transit district uh, having to do with a metro base project. Looking on page 16 63 of our agenda packet. It talks, this is the capital budget. It talks about construction related projects at the beginning and it includes uh, almost $2 million in funding for rehabilitation of the Metro base, uh, the, the center in Santa Cruz. And I, so I, I think I heard that the, uh, that the transit district was making some decisions about a joint project with the city of Santa Cruz to, um, rebuild the metro base and I just wondered if we could get a little uh, update from the manager about what the status of that project is and how it relates to the budget. Thank, thanks for being available Grace but it looks like they want uh, the next authority. So Alex go ahead if you can shed some light on that I'd appreciate that. Sure. Um, I'm sorry I, don't, I didn't catch the page number and I think you referenced metro base probably talking about Pacific Station? Yes. Yes, okay. Metro, uh, the only reason why I ask is Metro Base is a term we used 
when we were building the operations facility. So oh, I just I'm wanted sorry. To, and I'm that one's behind done. the times. So thank goodness that one's done. I didn't want to allocate any more money Close to that. that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Metro Center Station Rehabilitation Pacific, <coughs> Pacific Station. That's yes. page 16 th uh, uh, 63. Okay. Uh, yeah, just to give answer your question on the um, progress of that. So as you may or may not be aware, that uh, discussion about what the future holds for Pacific Station uh, has been an ongoing discussion in excess of 10 years, has gone through many iterations of review of possible projects. Uh, shortly after I came aboard, there was a project ongoing with Group 4 to look at what could be done in the way of a transit-oriented development with a tarmac below a building structure that it eventually became so cost prohibitive that it went to the side. We then engaged the city in further discussions, further study of the facility. We needed to answer some questions like, do all bus operations need to come to a central point? Do you, do you need to have this sort of pulse system or can you disperse those bus operations throughout the downtown area? We did some studies and, and those studies revealed that given the nature of our operating region, uh, the way that it is laid out and the way our service is run on very limited sort of northwest uh, corridors, that this type of system that we have designed here is the optimal system as opposed to dispersing throughout the downtown. So then that caused us to refocus on Pacific Station. So since we've now determined that we're not going to disperse the services and where they end and connect, um, we engaged, we've been engaging the city in, in additional discussions on where to go. We took a pause for several months while we evaluated our existing structure. So that building that we have on the property uh, was reviewed very thoroughly because we have uh, had problems, ongoing problems with leaking uh, during the, the rains, not just the roof, but the windows. Um, and we determined that there was a significant investment needed in order to bring that up to um, really good standards, reasonable standards, to the tune of about $5.6 million. So that gave us a pause point now to go uh, reinstitute, if you will, the discussions with the city about how this project might fit into the redevelopment that is ongoing between our property line and Laurel. Uh, there's, there's discussions about a, a development and whether that sort of continuity of development can include our property. And one thought that's being kicked around, and this is very preliminary, is that we would remap the property, city owns some property adjacent to ours, remap it all, and you might have a uh, commercial retail office, uh, clinic, housing along Pacific Avenue, multi-story, and then a bus tarmac, 25 bay bus tarmac on the backside facing Front Street. So that's where we're at. Our board just at their last meeting approved us to, uh, approved me to start negotiations with the city on uh, what we might do next together. Do you have any kind of a timeline for how that project might be moving full, might move forward? Well, all of that is dependent on funding. There is significant gap in funding right now uh, relative to what we have, what the city has. And so the conversation will turn to grants. What kind of grant opportunities or the opportunity zone that that's in? Could that bring some revenues to bridge this big gap in funding? Now, if that's all resolved, let's say over the next several months, the city and myself and the board come to conclusion on a funding model that is fundable. That's the key. Not funny money, but fundable. Then uh, the process of actually designing, going through the environmental and building is probably a two to three, three year process once we identify the money. So you're expecting to have a, a conclusion to the funding analysis in the next three months, would you say? I'd, I'd like that to be the case. I, I, I won't stand here and tell you that absolutely will be the case, but that is a good target for me. Okay, well, thank you very much for that update. I, this is a very significant project for Santa Cruz generally, downtown Santa Cruz in particular, and for, I think, the metro system as well in terms of how the bus system is going to operate. So uh, given our oversight role and funding role, I think it's um, – I appreciate being able to take the time to s ask about what it is. And frankly, I – in the motion to approve this, I'm go if I make the motion, I'm going to ask that we get a report back in, um, in the fall about the status of this project, because I think it is an important one for us to keep our eye on. I'd be happy to do that. Commissioner Brown. Yeah, I, um, I don't have further questions. Um, thank you for laying out the trajectory of those conversations related to the Pacific Station project. Um, 
you know, as a, as a council member who's been following this um, and, and as somebody representing the city of Santa Cruz, one of the least affordable places to live in the world, <laughs> um, um, and having been apprised of the, the uh, discussions happening with the Metro from my council colleagues on the Metro board, um, you know, we really are, uh, have been waiting patiently to, um, to try to bring this project to fruition. I'm glad to hear that um, there is some movement. Um, we do have some, as you know, some funding available. We have some potential opportunities with the state and to the extent that we can, pr we can actually move forward and have a plan that will really be helpful for us. So appreciate your uh, willingness to, to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Leopold. Well, um, <coughs> I'm also, uh, uh, I'm glad that people are happy with the progress we've been making. You know, the Metro has uh, uh, taken a lot of time over the last 15 to 20 years trying to make uh, this project a reality, uh, sought grant funding, bought the property uh, next door, the Greyhound Station, cleaned that up. Uh, the city had, a, had a di you know, originally a different plan that was uh, unfundable, and then we had the Great Recession. And so... Now, um, you know, we've done this, at the, uh, uh, another study at the request of the city, uh, and w we all s now seem to be on the same page to move this forward. And so I think uh, working together, we can create a great project that will benefit both the city of Santa Cruz and the transit district. And I would move approval of the item with the additional uh, um, uh, direction to get a report back in the fall on the status of the project. Second. Motion by Leopold, second by uh, Skipper. And b before I call the vote, I just want to add to this. Uh, Alex, you can go ahead and sit down here. This is stuff you already know. Uh, I sit on the Capitol Subcommittee along with uh, Director Matthews and Director McPherson, and we've been working diligently on this project with uh, Santa Cruz City Economic Development. And uh, we finally brought this to a vote after getting all the information back. And, you know, to <coughs> the nuts and bolts of this whole project is, is this could be potentially a, a $12 million project. And the Metro is in a position to where maybe they have four or five million dollars. So we, we have about a five or six million dollar shortfall. Uh, but we've got some encouraging advice from AMBAG. We've engaged AMBAG and they've got some funding that they think we might be eligible for. This is a unique project because it incorporates transit and housing in the same location. This is something that our governor is very favorable on trying to uh, develop. And um, I'm going to try to meet with uh, uh, Assemblyman. Um, um, Wiener, Scott Wiener, and said he seems to be a, a powerful force these days in getting things done. We're going to try to move this along because that gap of uh, five or six million dollars, I think, is something that we can narrow down. And uh, we all know this would be a great project for uh, for the Metro uh, uh, riders and for the city of Santa Cruz. So, uh, Alex, thank you for sharing that information in this uh, motion. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously, and we will continue to report back on this. Thank you. Okay, that'll take us to um, a Caltrans report. <coughs> Ms. Love. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today is the day that we honor our fallen workers at Caltrans. You can't, it's this small. I have a little emblem uh, honoring the workers, um, highway workers who have lost their lives in the line of duty. And today, just coming up here at 10 a.m. at the district office in San Luis Obispo, we're having our memorial. This follows on the statewide memorial that was held last week in Sacramento. Um, <coughs> there's been a total of 189 highway workers who've lost their lives in the line of duty. That's 189 too many. We, it's, it's um, interesting that I'm frequently at the, the RTC meeting in this room <laughs> on the same day. It just happens, it's a coincidence that it falls on the same day. Um, but. It's, it's always uh, remarkable to think about um, the workers on the road, um, CHP, emergency responders, tow truck drivers, highway workers, um, you name it, um, uh, construction contractors. There are a lot of people who put their lives on the line, literally, uh, daily, to, to make it so that we can get where we, where we need to go. And they are literally in harm's way. When you see lights or you see cars pulled over on the side of the road, please take note of that. If you're on a freeway, please move over, <laughs> slow down and move over when you can. And please just stay alert when you drive. Uh, leave home uh, a little earlier if you know that there's inclement weather or you um, know that it's going to be a busy day if it's a weekend day or uh, you know there's gonna, you're just gonna need a little extra time. And, and please just put your devices down. Um, all of that um, chatter can wait. And I just um, want to uh, 
implore you to do that. Uh, as uh, your executive director mentioned, for Highway 9, we're also pleased to participate in the multi-agency effort to look at the next steps from the Complete Streets Corridor Plan uh, that I know, I believe, is coming to this body in June for adoption. Caltrans engineers are busily uh, evaluating the many suggestions that have come forward, and I think we have multiple opportunities to, to implement things together in partnership, and we're looking forward to forging new and different partnerships in this regard. Caltrans has a commitment to safety of all users, uh, including pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, transit riders, <clears throat> and I think we have many new opportunities ahead that we haven't had in the past. So I look forward to that. And meanwhile, your growing list of projects is here in your agenda. Um, and if you have any questions on those, I can try to answer them. Sure. Any questions for Ms. Lowe? Ms. Commissioner Caput. Yeah, I, I want to thank, uh, thank you for the work you've been doing with uh, uh, South County and uh, uh, with uh, Highway 152, known as East Lake Avenue in Watsonville. Uh, the sidewalks are, they started with the sidewalks uh, under the Disability Act. And uh, just for the public's information, that'll be on both the uh, north side and the south side, right? Both sides of uh, Highway 152. Uh, there, will, there will be a small problem at the bridge, but uh, that's something that will have to be addressed later. That's at Houlihan and College Road. And also, uh, the pedestrian signal upgrades on 129 and 152, mm -hmm. uh, Riverside Drive and East Lake Avenue. So uh, I, I guess we can get a complete list on what we're looking at later on, uh, actual sites that have been identified. This is the project listed number eight under construction project? Uh, if, yes. If you'd like a, a map of individual locations, we can we can get that to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. How, how, how long did it take you? You have to drive to get to this meeting all the way from where? San Luis Obispo? <laughs> what time did you leave? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I left yesterday. <laughs> okay. <A> smart woman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. A any other questions for Ms. Lowe? Just a comment. Go, go ahead. Sure. You know, I think the uh, point about uh, the, the fallen workers is a, is a very good one. On our on our drive up uh, this morning from Watsonville, it was choked, of course. Uh, you know, the traffic is, is <coughs> pretty bogged down. There's really no room to, to move over. I mean, there could be room, but there's not room currently. But fortunately, the, uh, the flow of traffic was so slow that uh, the workers could uh, almost get out of your, your way if you were a um, distracted driver. But, you know, everyone needs to be much more cautious uh, and more careful, particularly around the uh, Caltrans and contractor crews. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add to that. Uh, you know, I, uh, I was driving home last night uh, over Highway 17. There's paving going on at night. And uh, two lanes of traffic are moved over to one side of the road, and it's pretty much just separated by cones. And I was pretty amazed that the workers are out there. This is their regular uh, job site, and uh, they were literally three or four feet away from ongoing traffic at whatever speed they decide to go. And I think, um, you know, we, we always pay attention to uh, the risks that firefighters and police officers are placed at. And I think it's a valid point that Ms. Lowe brings up that Caltrans people are in harm's way on a regular basis. And in honor of the 189 people that uh, have uh, lost their lives doing the job, I'd just like to take a moment of silence and reflect on that if we can. Thank you for that. And Ms. Lowe, did you have another comment or? Uh, well, you just reminded me that there w you'll see more initiatives by the department to, to bring safety up in even higher. Safety is our number one priority. Uh, the director has um, implemented a new policy to, to reduce speeds in work zones by 10 miles an hour universally. And she has also determined that she will be having, she will be hiring a chief safety officer, the first one in the department's history. Just for the record, what is the safe speed in the driving zone currently? Uh, the, um, well, the, the work zones are each treated differently and they're usually posted speeds. Sometimes there are warning speeds, but they, they vary. But it's, um, it would be 10, 10 miles below. Some 
sometimes there isn't a speed restriction. Okay. Uh, but we, you will be seeing more speed restrictions. You will be seeing more <laughs> lane closures um, for longer periods of time. We do a lot of night work. We've, we've, we've. Um, I, I think it's safe to say the department has um, worked very, very hard to to do our maintenance and construction work in a way that um, minimizes the um, impact to the traveler and work very hard at that. And we have to balance that by the safety of the workers. So they're, you know, they sure. could see a few more delays and things like that, but that's the intent. And I, I r thank you for the moment of silence. That, that sure. was. It's well deserved. And so the slow for the cone zone will be slower for the cone zone. Thank then. you. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you for that. All right, let's uh, move on to, uh, we have the Capitola Public Works uh, update. What's going on at Capitola? Um, I have a point I'm sorry. of uh, information. We have a 930 public hearing scheduled. Are we not going to have that? <coughs> no, uh, Kailash, I'm going to have you hold off, and we're going to move to that. And I thank you for bringing that up, uh, Commissioner Shippen. I'm going to hold you off until we do that, because we need to do that on a timely basis. So let's, um, let's jump to uh, the 930 public hearing. This is a 2019 unmet paratransit and transit needs. Grace. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Grace Blakesley of your staff. This is an item that you hear annually, and it's something that's really near and dear to my heart to be able to bring to you the information from the Elderly and Disabled Transportation co um, Committee, one of your advisory committees. Um, some of the unmet needs that are unique to people who are living with disabilities and seniors, and the types of um, priorities needed to help them avoid isolation and, cr and maintain independence. Um, the, the purpose of the unmet needs is really comes from the Transportation Development Act statute, which requires transportation planning agencies that use TDA funds for streets and roads to implement a public process, including a public hearing to identify the unmet transit needs and um, unmet transit and paratransit needs. Um, RTC does not allocate Transportation Development Act funds to local streets and roads and therefore is actually not required to perform this analysis, but the RTC endeavors to solicit regular input on these needs every year and it provides a useful tool to assess and prioritize these needs region wide. The Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory <laughs> Committee also serves as a social services transportation advisory council per the TDA statute, and they, re they regularly hear at their meetings discussion of unmet paratransit and transit needs. The unmet paratransit and transit needs are those transportation needs which are not currently being met, um, have community support, and do not duplicate transit services provided publicly or, or privately. <laughs> So attached to your um, staff report today, attachment one is the 2019 unmet paratransit and transit needs list. The updates since the 2018 um, adopted list are shown in underline and strikeout, and we re routinely provide this document to you in this way. Um, you'll see there's a prioritization given to the unmet needs, um, both a number system as well as a um, letter system for a high medium, indicating high, medium, and low. High, medium, high priority items are those that are considered to fill a gap in service or um, where there's not ongoing service. So either the gap, the service is not available or it's not ongoing. Um, medium priority items are those that would supplement an existing service. So an example might be a service that's provided um, from nine to four um, and, and it would be to expand that service um, from seven to six or to the weekends. That would be an example of um, to supplement an existing service. Um, a low priority item doesn't mean it's not a priority, it's still an unmet need, but it may be identified low priority because there's more specific planning required to identify um, what the specific need um, is or is because um, it may only serve a, it may not, addre it not address a basic need for <coughs> as transportation such as transportation to a medical appointment or for basic needs. Um, when you look at the one, two, and three, we really tried to add that component to the unmet needs list when we adopted the 2014 Region of Transportation Plan. It helps to indicate to what extent um, it addresses the Regional Transportation Plan goals. The, Im the um, input is received from a variety of sources um, to develop this list. It's primarily developed through the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee, which includes CTSA staff as well as Metro staff. We also coordinate with Metro Planning staff, uh, the Volunteer Center, um, 
and we, we do receive public input. Attachment two is the public input received for this year's process. I was really pleased to see some engagement in, this, in the process. We did consider that public input when we were developing the unmet needs. We felt that most of them were addressed or there's opportunities um, to be addressed through further conversation with the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee. I wanted to highlight just a few of the updates um, that are shown in underline and strike out in your packet. Um, one of them is um, a focus on development of new uh, medical facilities along transit lines, um, a focus on the need for on-demand transportation services, kind of the the challenge that's the community's facing with the introduction of the tra transportation network companies and the decrease in taxi service that's available. Um, so uh, taking a closer look at how to address that on-demand transportation service need. Um, there's also was identified a need for more regular communication amongst the transportation providers themselves so that they can be do a better job of referring um, folks who call them. We do have a guide for specialized transportation services, so one of the thought was to make sure that every agency in that document um, is um, informed and is takes a look at all the other services provided annually. There was also a funding need identified for electric transit vehicles. You heard a little bit about that earlier. Um, we also took a look at incorporating some of the transit needs that were identified as part of the Unified Corridor Study, such as transit priority and dedicated transit facilities. And this list really continues to be a comprehensive list of the unmet needs um, identified through our various stakeholders in Santa Cruz County. It's always important to clarify that the unmet needs list is not a funding recommendation per se. It does not prioritize projects for funding, but we do use this list when um, grant funding opportunities occur. For example, we know there'll be a section 5310 grant funding opportunity coming up this summer, so we'll, we'll be referring closely to this list um, and working with E&D TAC to identify priorities for that grant source. I really want to again just thank all the stakeholders that took time to really dive deep into this list. We've had calls from um, c different folks this year kind of talking to us about what they see as a need and they're always really appreciated, appreciative when we can point to the list and say, you know, we have really talked about that. Take a look here. Let's dive a little bit deeper. And so I just want to take, uh, take a moment to say thank you to all the stakeholders. For action today, we're recommending that the RTC adopt the 2019 Unmet Paratransit and Transit Needs List with amendments as appropriate following a public hearing and consider these transit and uh, paratransit needs as funding becomes available. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Ms. Blake, Le Director Leopold? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Blake, I was wondering if you could just address the, the some of these uh, unmet transit needs. Uh, were, were reduced from a high priority to a medium priority, and I'm trying to get some sense as to what that means. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity um, to talk about the, the benefits of Measure D funding. Um, that's really what we're seeing there. Um, Kirk Ains from Community Bridges is here and can speak to some of the specific um, projects that have been implemented as a, as a result of Measure D funding through LiftLine, um, as well as the funding to continue transit operations. One example is um, the, we'll have ongoing service for same day um, medical trans paratransit rides, which before was grant funded, it was difficult to continue, and um, now it is an ongoing program uh, service is also provided seven days a week um, through community bridges. So these are some of the improvements that were considered gaps before. They can always be improved, but um, they have been reduced from to a, to a medium priority, and it was really exciting for us to be able to do that, thanks to Measure D. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. So, um, that Q&A just answered my question. <laughs> I like how brilliant minds think alike. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, this is a public hearing, so I'd like to open it up to the public. Anybody like to uh, come and weigh in on this? Thank you. Hello, uh, Peter Stanger again. Um, I'm glad that uh, this has come before the RTC. The um, needs that I see is the absence of a bus route that goes through La Selva Beach and along San Andreas Road. Um, as the father of twins that have orthopedic uh, problems. Um, the lack of bus service means that my sons have to at literally walk across, well we don't want them on San Andreas, so they have to walk across the railroad trestle and then across the fields to get to the bus stop 
over at um, CC Convention Center. So they have to leave 45 minutes earlier to make that walk and so they can catch the bus that only comes every two hours. Um, I know that there's been Route 54, because I used to take 54, and that it wasn't, uh, <coughs> wasn't working because there wasn't enough ridership. And the reason for that, I believe, is that 54, even when it was running every half an hour, was the end of a line of a deadhead uh, route. And if I, I would like to, uh, on your report you have from my neighbor, Bonnie Gutierrez, and she's saying exactly what I'm asking you to do, and that is to have Route um, 69 or any of the other ones uh, uh, come down San Andreas Road and stop at the corner of San Andreas and um, Playa Boulevard make another stop at uh, Renaissance High School, KOA, make another stop, well, she has Buena Vista, I would rather do it at Zills Road or Monterey Bay Academy, and another stop at the farm labor camp before going into Watson Village of Transit Center. Um, if it was on part of a route that was actually connected and was moving fast and was regular, I think that it would have enough um, ridership on it that it would benefit the community by, again, giving bus service to that area of Santa Cruz County that is totally unserved now. And I think it would be a good move by Metro. Thank you. Thank you for those suggestions. Hi, this is Brian Peoples Trail Now. Um, this is really good work. This is exactly the kind of analysis um, that you need to do to understand your requirements on providing the services that are needed for the community. Um, in addition to this, though, you have to kind of step back and say, you know, do a root cause analysis of why do I have these shortcomings? And if you did a root cause analysis, you probably would realize that, <coughs> you know, you got to allocate it into the appropriate areas. And this is why we're strongly advocating not to waste money on the train and on building a trail for a future train. And yeah, it is showboating when you're, when you're advertising that when you have these kind of shortcomings. So, so we encourage you to keep doing this type of analysis, but be truthful in how, why these problems are occurring. Why? Do we have this limited funds? Because if you look at it, $1.6 million to maintain the corridor is seven articulating buses operating in a year. I think it might be eight, actually. Eight articulating buses that could service the community. So this great work but follow through with mitigation activities. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, good morning. Um, today, uh, my name's Carol Childers. Today I'm wearing both my Meals on Wheels hat and my um, Senior Commission hat. I represent the San Lorenzo Valley. We still have a lot of unmet needs for our very isolated elderly up in the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, I have one example for you. Um, we have a man who lives way out in Lompico, and I'm talking up on a ridge. <laughs> Very difficult to access, but we get him his meals every week. The other day, um, I was driving up Graham Hill Road, and I see a man crumbled on the sidewalk. And I thought, first I thought he was a worker. And then as I drove by, I thought, he's not working on anything. So I turned around, um, and this is right in front of the sheriff's substation. Luckily, a very large man pulled in behind me, and we both go down and we talk to this man, and I realize he's our client. And I said, how did you get, first of all, are you injured? He said, no, he didn't want assistance. He just wanted to be picked up. So this very big man picked him up, and um, I said, how did you get down here? He said, well, the only way I can afford to get down here is to hitchhike. He needed milk. Well, so he hitchhikes down, 
Um, have any of you been out Lompico Road lately? There's two spots where the lanes are falling apart. Um, but he hitchhikes down, he walks down, hitchhikes down to the Safeway in Felton, and he tripped on his way back up. Well, he wouldn't let anyone give him a ride home. He hitchhiked back. Um, he's trying to maintain his independence as much as he can. Um, gratefully, you know, he fell where someone could help pick him up. He falls off Lompico Road. Will someone find him? Um, so we need to really work and remember that we have a lot of very isolated, elderly, low-income folks, and we need to be able to reach them. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners and staff. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Kirk Ants. I'm the program director for Lifeline, a program of community bridges. And I'm thankful that the RTC does the unmet needs list. Uh, we, are, we partake in part of that as a, a stakeholder, even though they're not required to do it. We appreciate it. It's helped us greatly in getting grants, supported our, our claims for the need for certain types of transportation, which uh, Grace had mentioned earlier, the same day in the out-of-county transportation, which we were able to um, show that we needed the funding, that it was unmet needs. And We've gotten funding for two and a half years to do that, so we're providing two additional drivers to provide that same-day transportation, mostly to medical appointments or things that are related to health and also out of county, which we go as far as uh, San Francisco County. We go to Santa Clara, we go to Stanford as well uh, on a daily basis to the vets in Monterey. And this uh, helps support people that don't have means to get to those appointments that are specialized appointments. Uh, could be for children, Luce Lucille Packard, and those sorts of things. So we're really thankful for that list and um, the continued growth. And also, uh, the operations facility for LiftLine was on there, and we'll, I'll be talking about that a little later. So uh, great accomplishments. I also sh share the passion that Carol <coughs> just had about the clients and the isolation. So we're always looking to see how we can better meet those needs in the in the county. Thank you. Thank you. morning. My name is Johanna Lighthill and I live in Seacliff and I want to thank you for considering all the, our comments today. Um, I have a short story. When I was growing up, I used to visit my grandmother in Santa Clara. She lived behind the food villa off of Stevens Creek Boulevard, which is now Bed Bath & Beyond. She used to walk to the grocery store almost every day and she'd often uh, return empty-handed, but she could come back and tell us what was on sale and the price of ham for the day. And you know, I thought it was a, s a strange story, but I was a kid and I didn't think much more about it. Not until my own mother, in her later years, lived behind the uh, Safeway off of Airport Boulevard in Watsonville. She too frequently uh, walked to the stores whether she needed to or not, and she refused my offers to do her shopping for her. And it was only then that things started to make sense for me. Uh, to some, a walk is more than a walk. Um, to these women, walking was not only exercise, but a, a demonstration of self-reliance and sometimes their only socialization for the day. Uh, they al this, um, the outings allowed them independence and dignity. Neither wanted to burden others if they could do for themselves. And I think most people feel this way. So as you consider future mobility and transit needs for our county, I ask that you remember those whose needs may seem less apparent, but are nonetheless just as important. Please facilitate mobility by providing safe and direct walking routes within communities, ones that are hopefully pleasant, but more importantly, separated from the hazards of both cars and bicycles. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sally Arnold, Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, I read over the comments uh, for the unmet transit needs, and I was at the um, Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee meeting last month, and um, I could, what struck me was that there's all these like individual needs that people are talking about. Um, you know, there's the 
safe passage for elderly people to walk from one place to another. And oh, well, we need ways for the disabled to get around on public transit. And you know, the, but I think that um, when we look at it system wide, um, as opposed to like just picking off little problems, we can see that there are some uh, big solutions available to us, and that I feel like the unified corridor study was the beginning of starting to think like big about how can we system wide improve transit in the in the community. And I um, uh, it will not surprise you to know that I'm going to say that I think that the uh, rail trail with the high capacity transit is going to be a just a game changer for people. It will provide that accessible route for people to walk in their communities away from traffic. I mean, a segment 7B or phase two um, on the west side is an example of providing a much more level accessible grade to get from the west side to, to the beach area, which is not, there just isn't one right now. People just have steep hills. And the difference of some kind of a transit vehicle that allows people to just roll on and roll off with a wheelchair, I mean, that's a level of accessibility that is far superior to waiting for the lift, to, eh, 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 you know, roll on, get strapped in, eh, 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 roll off, get strapped in. I mean, it's a, I mean, that's great, it's better than nothing for sure, but if we can get a roll on and roll off kind of transit available on the corridor, that's gonna be a level of independence that will be really appreciated by people. So I just wanna encourage people to continue to think big and think about system-wide solutions to solving these individual problems. Thank you. Thank you for your optimism. <laughs> Anybody else I'd like to comment? With that, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back for discussion and action. Well, I'd move a staff recommendation on this item. Motion by Schiffer. I'll second. Second by I, Leopold. I want to also thank the staff for doing the work. The outreach is really important. The comments we received here today are, are, are also very helpful, and I know there are Metro representatives here who are listening to uh, the needs uh, for the bus system, and I know that that's a constant discussion uh, at, the, at the transit board about how <laughs> we best meet the transit needs of people in Santa Cruz County. So we'll take that seriously. Any other comments? I, I just want to uh, add one thing. I, I'm I'm really happy to see the, the uh, uh, I call a new inspired relationship between the RTC, Metro, and uh, Community Bridges and Lift Line specifically to work together to meet the needs of every agency. So I'm really happy with that new relationship. So with that, we'll have a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thanks, Grace. Do you have a comment? I just would want to make one more comment. Sure. Many of the elderly and disabled transportation advisory committee members have been involved in the um, art and history exhibit on senior isolation that's up now through the early September. And I, I would recommend if um, members of the public um, and commissioners uh, visit that exhibit. It really does tell a great story. Great. Thanks, Grace. Okay. Um, we're going to go back. Uh, to the uh, City of Capitola Public Works uh, update. Kailash, come on in and let us know what's going on in Capitola with uh, RTC money. Thank you, Commission members. Let me pull up the slideshow. First of all, I'd like to echo what Commission Member and Council Member Bodarf said. We we'd like to welcome all of you to Capitola. It's fun to have all of you here, and we enjoy working with our TC staff. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is just to provide you a quick update on the transportation projects that have been completed and funded, and also completed with uh, coordination with the RTC, which has been a very helpful uh, partner on a lot of these projects. This is a, the list of all the projects that we'll run through. First, we'll talk about the two projects that were completed last year. Then we'll go through the projects that we are anticipating to have um, go into construction in the next in this next fiscal year. And then there's two un unfunded projects that we just wanted to highlight that are out there, but we're still working on funding availability. So the first project is the 2018 slurry seal that was completed last year with help from the Measure D, and it allowed us to uh, complete slurry sealing on about 2.6 miles within the city of Capitola. That was completed in late fall of last year. The next project was a sidewalk uh, completion project, so 38th Avenue 
was part of a complete streets project, then the one segment of the sidewalk was not completed in the first phase of the project. So we were able to go back last year and complete that corridor. So that allows passenger or pedestrian travel all the way up 38th to the, the Capitola Mall area, which is serves a, a large area of a residential community there. So it, it's a been a big improvement for the community. And the next project that we have is coming up for this year. Uh, this project we plan to go out to bid next month. And this is a longstanding project that will has been a need for the city of Capitola, which will provide uh, both uh, bicycle and pedestrian access um, from the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood and New Brighton Middle School down into the village. And there's about 1,600 feet of new sidewalks that will go in on the north side of Park Avenue and will also in improve the striping for bicycle and pedestrian uh, crossings at all of those uh, streets that are included. The next project that we're currently working on and recently uh, we're, we're given some input from the, te the technical advisory committees through the RTC is the Bromer Street Improvement Project. Uh, this street w is in, as many of you may know, is in a state of needs a lot of repair. And there's also a portion of sidewalk that's also, there's a gap at the intersection closest to 41st Avenue. So this project will rehabilitate the full roadway, uh, improve the signage for bicycle and pedestrian use, and then complete that portion of sidewalk on the north side of Bromer Street. We've already had our community workshops and we're just have been soliciting input on design and we'll be going, hopefully have completion of design later this summer to go out to bid in the fall. This is also another project that has been able to be completed through uh, funding through the RTC. Our next project I'd like to highlight is also on Park Avenue. This was a project that was a result of a storm, storm damage from the 2017 uh, storm season where we had a, we just finished re rehabilitating the whole section of Park Avenue and then three large eucalyptus trees fell over and damaged the road shoulder and, and uh, bike lane to Park Avenue. And currently we're, we've, we've finished our engineering and we'll be submitting our, our packet to, to Caltrans where the, this is eligible for federal funding. And that hopefully will also go to bid this summer with completion uh, either in the fall or the spring of next year. And then one other project that we have in the works uh, further down on Park Avenue, close to where we're at now, it, it's a pedestrian pathway that will provide access from our upper Pacific Cove parking lot that then goes up to the intersection of Park and, Mon and Monterey and will allow for access to the future Monterey Bay Scenic Trail and also allow all the visitors who come to Capitol and make use of those public parking places to have a safer route of travel down into the village and to the beach. And that concludes all the projects that I wanted to update you guys on, and I'm here to answer any questions. Otherwise, I would just like to reiterate that we really enjoy working with RTC staff. They're very helpful for us, being a small agency. They, they provide a lot of additional staff support and knowledge about what's going on throughout the community and at, in the regional level that helps us uh, secure funding and input that is always beneficial for our projects. Thanks, Kailash. Any questions? Director Leopold. Uh, well, I'll just say uh, thank you for the presentation and thank you for the work. I'm um, uh, speci especially happy to see the 38th Avenue and the Bromer Street because very often people contact the county because they think it's a county road and they, they say, when are you going to do that? And I said, talk to the city of Capitola, it's their road. So <laughs> it's really great to see that moving forward. I know that that's something that people have really wanted to have done and especially that Bromer Street portion is, is – is, is pretty bad right now. So when uh, when it gets fixed, it'll be amazing. So thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Kailash, for that presentation. Okay, we'll move back up <laughs> to uh, item 28 now. This is the Safe on 17 uh, Safety Corridor Program. Amy. Hi. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Amy Naranjo, Commission Staff and Program Manager for the Safe on 17 Program. Uh, my item today is on the 2018 Safe on 17 Annual Report. The annual report discusses the work of the task force, which has been active for 20 years to reduce collisions and improve <coughs> motorist safety on the Highway 17 corridor between the cities of Santa Cruz and Los Gatos. 
The SAFE 117 Task Force is a partnership between the RTC SAFE, MTC SAFE, CHP Santa Cruz, and CHP San Jose, as well as Caltrans in Districts 5 and 4. Uh, task Force members also include local police, fire, legislators, and members of the local media. The Task Force meets twice a year to discuss the outcomes of CHP's extra enforcement and education efforts and to share information on Caltrans' current projects and maintenance activities on Highway 17. The group has identified three main strategies for reducing collisions. It's extra enforcement um, of safe driving practices, road improvements, and public education. We typically refer to these as the three E's, education, uh, engineering, and, and uh, education. Um, enforcement, sorry. <laughs> um, the, the role of the RTC in the Safe on 17 Task Force is to provide funding for extra CHP enforcement. We currently provide $50,000 a year for enforcement on the Santa Cruz County side, and MTC Safe provides $50,000 on the Santa Clara County side. We also facilitate the biannual task force meetings and prepare the annual report, which I'll summarize today. Uh, the, the packet begins on page 28-7 of your packet and includes various types of data from CHP, Caltrans, and so forth. Um, in 2018, there were 801 total collisions on 17 uh, in, in the corridor. Two of those were fatal and 269 of those collisions were uh, injury collisions. Now these injury and fatal collisions have increased substantially over the last three years, including in coming into 2019. And the average number of injury and fatal collisions have been higher, 8.5 percent higher than the pre-program average of 249 injury collisions uh, between 1996 and 1998. There are a couple of reasons for the increase in collisions. Um, a few of them are likely a combination of factors, which include distracted driving, speeding, and unsafe lane changes. However, the data also shows a correlation between annual rainfall amounts and the number of collisions. And you'll see in attachment three on your report, um, the annual rainfall on 17 from 2011 until now, and you can see how as rain goes up, collisions go up as well. Um, traffic volumes also affect the number of collisions. And essentially, the greater the traffic volume on 17, the greater the likelihood of collisions. And in 2013, there were approximately about 54,000 vehicles uh, per day on 17, whereas now it, that's gone up to about 66,000 trips. And that was the counts as of 2017. So. Um, it could be even more tr uh, vehicles that are going over as of now. Extra CHP enforcement is an essential element of the Safe on 17 program, and increased CHP visibility and citations being issued really provide a deterrent to motorists who practice unsafe driving behavior. And due to the increase in collisions on 17 over the last few years, uh, CHP has really targeted their extra enforcement um, at specific times of the day and at specific times of the year. Um, and using the data and the, the feedback that we get from the task force meetings to really strategize where they're going to put those, uh, those officers. Regarding uh, engineering projects and construction projects, Caltrans has also completed a number of safety <laughs> projects in, in the last year. Some of those included the Highway 17 shoulder widening and, and concrete guardrail project that was just north of Scotts Valley, and then the stormwater mitigation project that was between the Highway 117 interchange and Sims Road. And then as well, they continue to do tree and vegetation removal to keep the area clear. Some of the public education activities that have happened in 2018 included the Start Smarts driver safety classes hosted by the CHP, and those are for new drivers and teenage drivers to attend with their parents to learn um, essentially safe chip tips on how to, how to maneuver and drive on the road and keep safe. And then the Santa Clara County Fire Department also implemented a Safe on 17 campaign um, and produced a number of safety videos to really warn drivers about either distracted driving, tips for driving in the rain, driving in the mountains, as well as the dangers of secondary accidents um, when there are stalls on the highway. 
Um, RTC staff also use Cruise 511, our traveler information program, to really get out the messages, whether it was our own messages that we were creating and sharing, or messages from CHP, from Caltrans, and our other partner agencies, and getting the message out there, and, and really explaining to the motorists uh, what projects are happening, and if there's going to be any impacts in their travel. Um, as I mentioned previously, the Safe on 17 program is also funded with safe funds, and those funds are generated from the dollar registration fee on all vehicles residing in Santa Cruz County. Uh, funding for extra, CH, extra CHP enforcement has been $50,000 a year since the program started in 2002, and meanwhile, uh, overtime rates for CHP officers have gradually increased over the years, and since the program started, those overtime rates have increased 65%. Um, and then, so starting with fiscal year 2018, uh, the RTC has added an additional $25,000 in Measure D funds to help, um, to help with that additional CHP enforce, enforcement. And we've been working with CHP to amend the contract to get those contracts, to get those funds into the agreement. In addition, there's also been significant concern expressed by residents both on Santa Cruz County and Santa Clara County side. Um, really about the number of uh, injury collisions and looking to HSCs to see what they're doing. And so, therefore, beginning in fiscal year 2019 and 2020, um, the RTC is proposing an additional $50,000 in Measure D funds to augment the $50,000 in safe funds that goes to CHP Santa Cruz. And this will cover the inflationary cost increase of 65% and provide additional funds for even more enforcement on CHP or more enforcement with CHP to ensure that motorists drive accordingly and will help reduce collisions. That concludes my staff report. Uh, staff recommends that the RTC accept the 2018 annual report and approve the resolution to increase funding for CHP enforcement. I'm happy to take questions, and then Lieutenant Ian Troxell is also here from CHP Santa Cruz to answer any questions. Thank any you. questions for Ms. Naranjo? Uh, story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that report, um, and it was um, a little bit disturbing to see the increases uh, in the accidents over the last three years, and um, I noticed the cause had listed, but I was wondering, is there any evidence that impaired driving is contributing to the increase in collisions? <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Ian Troxell, Santa Cruz CHP. Um, I'm going to answer your question, but I want, want to add a, a couple of things here. Um, one of the things that has really helped is uh, on the engineering side of the house, uh, high friction surface roadway has helped some of those major curves like Laurel Curve and other areas to reduce collisions. Um, so that should be taken into account to extend high friction surface um, improvements uh, throughout Highway 17. Uh, from an education uh, perspective, we find that teaching youth works really well uh, through Start Smart and other courses, but as drivers age and get more experience, they kind of forget about the basics of driving safe, safely, and it becomes more of an opt-in type situation in order to get information, right? I can tune out a poster board or not take a, an edu educational class or turn the TV when I see something I don't like, right? So you gotta opt into it. From an enforcement perspective, that's where you don't have a chance to opt out. That one-on-one -on -one contact with the CHP officer <coughs> that makes the, the enforcement contact brings everything back in. It's the enforcement and then the educational process that that driver is gonna go through by going to court, traffic school, and the fine associated with whatever they're doing. Um, so I'm a strong proponent, obviously, of the enforcement side of the house to reduce uh, collisions on Highway 17 to save lives, ultimately. Um, as far as what uh, we're seeing uh, on the increase of fatalities and collisions across the state is distracted driving. That's ultimately what it is. And we just have to come up with some strategies uh, to figure that out, that, that piece, whether it's technology and cars that reduces the ability for drivers to, to interact with social media and er everything else uh, that's coming through a personal device in a car. Um, that's what we really need to look at. Um, as far as driving under the influence, it hasn't, there, I haven't really seen an increase um, as much as I thought I would see with legalization of marijuana and those types of things. Um, I haven't really seen the increase in, in, in DUI. So it's really a distracted driving 
It's really uh, unsafe turning movements, speed. Uh, those are your primary collision factors, um, specifically on Highway 17, but across the state. Uh, unfortunately, our mileage death rate has increased um, over the past three years where we are under one and now we're about 1.1, 1 1.2 .1, 1 um, on the mileage death rate. So, any questions for the Highway Patrol? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a lot better than it was. I, I remember years and years ago, uh, Highway 17. There was a time when the oncoming traffic in both directions were especially at night, the glare of the lights and everything. But with the uh, partitions and uh, also uh, the educational part, you're getting out to the drivers to be careful. Um, so, you know, it's it, what you're doing out there is really important. But um, is, is there currently a test or is anything in the uh, <coughs> for somebody driving under the influence of uh, marijuana? Uh, I know for uh, liquor of course there's a number of uh, blood tests breath you know <coughs> breath tests and all that or is with the marijuana are we still going through just being able to do the walk or whatever if you're stopped for driving under the influence uh, there's still a standardized set of field sobriety tests which can which include walk and turn finger in the nose and a couple of other tests <coughs> now as far as chemical testing um, the state still hasn't decided what nanogram level of uh, drug in the system would be uh, g going to be impairment. So it's based on how the person performs on a field sobriety test. Can they operate a motor vehicle safely? And if, they've, uh, if they have any objective sy symptoms of being under the influence of marijuana. And then, of course, if the chemical test comes back positive for marijuana. But right now we don't have a, a, a like a breathalyzer or a hair sample or a saliva that you can do on in the field right now. With uh, with uh, alcohol or whatever, uh, th they're going to jail, right? I mean, if they fail the not necessarily. Um, so in this county, they can they can <coughs> be cited out um, and not go to jail, and um, it they're. Most of most first time offenders will just go to the sobering center and sit in the sobering center for however long it takes them to sure. become um, sober. Yeah. Commissioner Story, did that answer all your questions? Do you have any follow up? Or? Yes, I've got the answer. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. And also thank you to the executive director and uh, staff bringing this forward. Um, you know, I mentioned some time ago that the funding for this particular program was essential because one of our top priorities is, of course, the health and safety of our citizens. And when you're losing people on the, f on the highway, um, when uh, serious accidents are happening, um, then we have to kind of adjust. I mean, you mentioned, it was mentioned that the number of people who travel that highway ro rose from, say, 50-some thousand to 60-some thousand. <laughs> The weather is going to be this or that. Well, we have to adapt to that. We have to make sure that we have in place all the weapons, I'll use that word, I guess, against, um, to fight against a culture of recklessness and speeding. And, you know, I really appreciate the fact, and y you alluded to it, Lieutenant, the, f the fact that there is education. Sometimes the young people see it, uh, <laughs> that fades, and it really gets down to enforcement because. Uh, we all, nobody wants to uh, opt out there, but you have to opt in when, you know, you see the red lights. And so, you know, I'm from Scotts Valley, and we work hand in hand. Uh, you know, Highway 17 is right in our backyard, and uh, we have a very good relationship. But I think whatever we can do, and, you know, I'm happy to see we've added another $50,000. I think we also have to look at it at some point and say, is 50000 enough? Because that roadway is a big integral part of, of this county going over, over the hill, making a living, coming back. And I think we've all been um, uh, exposed to drivers who were just so reckless uh, and dangerous that sometimes, uh, what is the eternal question? Where is the CHP when we really need them? And uh, have have family members uh, that I have uh, gotten a ticket on Highway 17? They have, okay. But 
getting a ticket and having enforcement is the most important thing to kind of degrade the recklessness that sometimes creeps into that culture. And uh, so whatever you can do uh, and what you have done, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the presentation. This is an issue in which uh, uh, I'm, I get a lot of calls on, I'm sure my colleagues get a lot of calls on, concerned about the safety. And that has, there's definitely been an uptick over the last two years, um, either because of the economy, the fact that, the, uh, that pe more people from Silicon Valley are buying houses over here in Santa Cruz County, the fact that there's more traffic on Highway 17 and possibly the rain. Um, uh, the people perceive that the that uh, it's a lot less safe than it used to be, and I appreciate the work of the staff um, th when we added money last year, and that we're going to increase it again this year. Because when you th th everything costs more than it did 15 years ago, but 15 years ago that $50,000 bought 850 hours of of enforcement time, and in t 2017, which is the last full year in which we have uh, data. That same fifty thousand dollars bought two hundred and sixty-six hours. So um, we're when you look at the statistics and you look at the, the correlate it with the um, number of hours in which we have enforcement. Enforcement works. It does play a, a significant role. The 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 roadway, the surface plays a role. The the rain plays a role. The distracted driving plays a role. But it's but people slow down when they see the officers um, and. Uh, we need to increase that funding over time to make sure that we have an adequate number of hours. So I really appreciate the work, the, the ongoing work of the Safe on 17 committee to be looking at this, um, that, that through that data it really makes a convincing case uh, to increase the funding for, for this. And I'm grateful for the people of Santa Cruz County who has the wisdom to vote for Measure D so we have these kind of resources to be able um, to provide funding um, a, on a critical route, transportation route uh, in the county in which I think there's 60,000 cars a day uh, that go on that, on that road. So that, that money is going, is going pretty far um, uh, uh, and will help uh, reduce congestion and improve safety. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Commissioner Rodka. It's always a happy day when John and Randy and I can all agree on something. And, <laughs> and I really feel strongly about this. It, you know, all these other issues are, are real, the intoxicated drivers and the, uh, the slickness of the road and the rain on, in a mountain road with pretty steep curves and so forth. But when you drive the road, I, you rarely go over the road when there's not at least one idiot that is going like 75, 80 miles an hour by you and no matter how safely you're driving it's like you're in the middle of a risky situation where it's, it could be really problematic and as john says people do slow down when they see the officers out there it makes a difference in how they respond and distracted driving can be an issue but i don't think these people that are speeding are d distracted I, in that in the typical sense they're not on their phones necessarily although occasionally you see that too but more often they're just driving really, really unsafely and really fast. And, and having enforcement is the only way to deal with that problem. If you made the road safer, they would drive still faster. Oh, like now I can go around the curve at like 85 miles an hour. And so I think having police officers there really makes a difference. And this is money well spent. And I'll certainly support the motion that's being proposed to us. Commissioner Gonzalez, I'll, 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 I'll keep this brief because I, I do, just like the fellow commissioner stated, uh, there. Speeding is a big issue there. Uh, I was a long time commuter over that hill and I, I experienced the uh, on Laurel Curve before they put the friction road on. Uh, just my truck just spun out because it was so slick. It is four in the morning. So you get the black dew on there and, and it was really awful. Um, so I do appreciate Caltrans for all the improvements they've done on that road. But um, but uh, speeding is really the big issue. And, and you know, when you have big vehicle trucks on that Highway 17 at commute time, it creates m more high speed traffic on folks that know that that right lane is empty and then they speed up and then they jam in and then they speed up. And so that also builds that because that opportunity to speed up, I guess. And I guess more education and more enforcement uh, on that w will help. And, and I support uh, this in funding you with more money in trying to create that. Um, but it, it is an <coughs> issue of, of having people uh, just literally just going too fast on that freeway and, and thinking that that freeway is actually designed for a high, high rate of speed. Thank you.
Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, about every six months or so in Scotts Valley, and I would assume other jurisdictions, uh, you get a confluence of all of the uh, law enforcement agencies who badges or something that come in and have concentrated enforcement for a half a day or a day. Does that ever happen on Highway 17 where you'll, instead of having two or three officers, you might have 10 or 12? So each jurisdiction decides where bad badges is a program of motorcycle officers that go out and enforce different traffic concerns. And it happened, we we're trying to get it monthly um, and each community decides where they want the officers to go and, and enforce. Um, we have some other grants. Uh, we have some DUI enforcement money that we use on Highway 17 um, that puts additional officers. But really the bottom line is since 1960, uh, 1970, our baseline of number of officers has remained the same. So we haven't increased our force to the numbers of commuters that we have out on the road. So I typically de deploy about six to eight officer officers for the entire county of uh, Santa Cruz uh, every day. Um, so to bring in 12 officers or, or um, of CHP officers, that wouldn't work, but yeah. uh, all of the allied agencies together, like a badges, um, we could do that. If, if say Scotts Valley PD decides that they want enforcement on that freeway portion of of uh, Scotts Valley, um, they could do that. They could use badges to do that. And that's, and that's something that um, they do monthly. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hurst, did you have a question? No, I don't. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin. I have a question for staff. I was a little confused about the funding that's being recommended. As I understood the staff report, um, the budget and last year or maybe this year is was increased by 25,000 and are we proposing in the 2019 2020 budget to go up an additional 25,000 or an additional 50,000 uh, what you what you uh, said first is correct okay so you, you're right for fiscal year 1819 the Commission approved an additional 25,000 in funding for measure D and so we're recommending now for fiscal year 1920 that that, that 25,000 become 50,000. So, so in it'll fact, be the increase is another 25,000. Increase another, 20, another 25,000, exactly. The other question I have has to do with we tend to talk about the funding for this program in terms of dollars, but Commissioner Rotkin brought up a, a point that I made me think about what we're really concerned about is the number of hours of extra enforcement that is being funded and it was of certainly of concern that that's been reduced was reduced be from 870 if I understood correctly to 200 and something as a result of increased costs until the money went up and I'm wondering if it would make sense for us to be when we're considering budgetary um, d uh, decisions on this program whether rather than simply seeing it as an, uh, uh, having a goal of having a certain amount of money really having a goal of a certain number of hours and I know that there are limits based on the number of officers that the CHP has to how many hours that they could um, they can provide an extra enforcement but the fact that initially there were 870 I just wonder how much it would cost to go one to go back to the 870 and two whether the CHP has the capacity at this point in terms of their force to provide that number of hours because I do kind of remember when it first went into effect uh, when I I don't drive over the hill that often but when I drove over the hill you know it was much more obvious that there were CHP officers available than it, than it is now and I, I think that's what we're all talking about is trying to get the level of enforcement increased um, to the extent costs go up, just providing additional money may not do it. So I guess I have a question for the CHP officer about whether the capacity exists for 870 hours, uh, if there was funding available, and two, if there is, how much more funding would need to be provided uh, for that capacity to be there. <laughs> right, so th that total number of hours, if, uh, if I'm, if I'm re remember this, this is for San Jose and Santa Cruz, mm -hmm. correct? Okay, so um, we, 
probably wouldn't be able to support 870 hours. You probably wouldn't. I'm just being honest. And because these officers. We need are, that. <laughs> um, these officers are working on overtime. Um, so they're working on their days off. Uh, they're working after shift, before shift, those types of things. So it might be a stretch, but I'll do some analysis for you. And then I'll report back to the committee to see exactly how many hours um, we can support. Um, I, th I think uh, that first step of the additional increase of the 25,000, that's definitely something we can support and through that, through that effort. But um, I'll do a little bit further analysis and get back maybe an, an actual number of hours. I think, that's, I think that would be appreciated and maybe um, if, as part of our next budget uh, consideration that we look at what it would cost to provide the uh, funding to support the number of hours that the CHP is able to provide. And you brought up another issue, of course, this is not just our side of the hill, it's the other side of the hill. And I know we were going to try to get additional money from the MTC. Was that successful? Are they also increasing their commitment to match the commitment that um, the, uh, this commission has approved? Uh, not as of this, uh, this fiscal year, but what they are interested and they're looking at uh, doing that in their next budget, uh, budget cycle. Well, I would, uh, in terms of uh, approving the staff recommendation, I would certainly add a, add a direction. I'm not making a motion. Okay. All right. Um, but I think it would make sense to add a direction that the commission uh, chair write a letter to the chair of the MTC strongly urging that they support the additional funding for the Safe on 17 effort. Before I get to Commissioner Brown, I just want to clarify. The, the, the hourly comment was brought up by Commissioner Leopold, not Commissioner Rodkin, just for the record. I'm and I, sorry. Uh, I'm I just, sorry, uh, you know, I What's know, I know you like everything to be accurate, so I wanted to make sure we had well, that. I definitely appreciate that. I know that. Chair. And uh, and I think what what uh, um, what we're all alluding to is that uh, the number that uh, Commissioner Leopold brought out. The, the, uh, first of all, CHP, thank you for sharing that you can't meet this obligation. I don't think you can provide the hours that we had. And based on my simple math, adding up what, what the number is, we would probably need another additional $100,000 to get to that number. Uh, I think incrementally what you're trying to do with us is $25,000 at a time. We're going to, you know, it's not about the money. I think it's about your abil ability to provide the, cert the, the hours of service. And that's what, that's what I took away from your comments. Yes, sir. So I, I want to make sure that if, the, if we're going to have a partnership with you and, and you're going to give back $25,000 to the Highway Patrol, that we're going to use that money. Um, and we're going to use it wisely. We're not going to have anything left over. So it's great. I think, I think the step-by-step -step process has definitely worked. Let's try the $25,000, see where it goes, where, where it takes us. Um, you know, any amount of money from here is going to save lives. Sure. It's going to reduce crashes on Highway 17. You're going to get in view patrol. You're going to get more officers on there. So. I'm going to go to Commissioner sure. Brown, then to Leopold here. Go ahead. So I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, the I want to thank the RTC staff for giving us this report. Um, really thorough uh, overview to help us understand what what's happening on Highway 17, and that combined with my own experiences, um, you know, anecdotal, <laughs> qualitative, seeing some of the bone chilling um, uh, collisions, and then other accidents, people going off into the canyons. Um, over time, uh, really kind of paints a picture that about the need for uh, law enforcement. To, uh, to monitor and, and um, so I definitely support the um, suggestions made by Commissioner Schifrin and I know uh, Commissioner Johnson has been uh, very much uh, an advocate of this and others as well so I, I'd be supportive of looking at uh, the costs and, and trying to increase our uh, contribution <laughs> over time um, and su certainly support the staff recommendation. Um, just wanted to say the last collision I was involved in <laughs> was um, on Highway 17 was uh, when I was rear-ended by uh, somebody who was reading a newspaper. So <laughs> it's been quite a long time, and this, <laughs> things have, have definitely changed <laughs> since then. So I I'm, uh, just want to appreciate all the work that you're doing to you. keep up with the time. Thank you. Commissioner Leopold. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, want, I think that what Commissioner Schifrin brings up is important about number of hours. But I don't want us, if you look at the, if the data about the number of hours and the collision information, there isn't exactly a, an, an apple to apple comparison that more hours brings less, you know, so I think that what, uh, that what has been important since the start of this program is the goal to reducing the number of collisions 
and the number of fatalities. And I don't. I think we want to keep on that. Um, and we w and we want to. We're trying to impact it by adding because we haven't added money. You know, bas you know, we're, we're basically using the same amount of funds that we had 15 years ago, and uh, so this will be a big increase. Um, and on top of last year, you know, it's a doubling, which is which is helpful. And then we should see what the statistics say. If the rain it plays a a, um, a major role, um, if we have you know we had a lot of years. If you look at that chart of the drought, where collisions were way down, um, and if we go into another drought, um, our our hours may not uh, be the deciding factor. Mm -hmm. So I think that we should we shouldn't get lost in the number of hours. We should look for the results and uh, be able to. Uh, um, examine and analyze what uh, what the results are telling us and I encourage I, I've gone to a number of safe on 17 meetings they're really interesting meetings you can you can really get down to the weeds on on uh, some of this data which I have found helpful and informative uh, for me and um, and I think we should we should keep on getting reports about that and maybe even include the safe on 17 uh, report in our in our information packet uh, when they come out quarterly, uh, to, so people could see what's going on. Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, I had a couple comments and then a question for the officer. So my first comment is, is I think it it, it goes without saying, but we d do need to say it for the members of the public that aren't familiar with this committee that this is an amazing example of an interagency collaborative effort that's gone on for years. It's really made a difference, and it's the best. It's the best of the best the way government works, and I just want to. Make sure that's stated, and thank you for the staff and all the agencies that participate. Um, I, too, have been to many of these Safe on 17 meetings, and if you're interested in how to make this one of the worst roads, unsafe roads, in the state of California, <laughs> despite all the efforts we've made, um, you should go to one of those meetings. They're public, and you do get a lot of information, and you can see the level of, high, very high level of collaborative um, cooperation and dialogue um, as to, okay, that didn't work, but this might, and the next step so I just want to appreciate that uh, my question is well I and one more comment I know a number of us including Commissioner Leopold have been in receipt of a, con a petition which I have provided to Caltrans today and by email of more than a thousand users regular daily users of safe on or 17 who are, are, are very interested um, in additional safety measures additional projects etc and one of the things that struck me as I was reading the petition um, and Caltrans will, will write a response because they've done a lot of work um, and I'll make sure that, in fact, I think I, I did uh, um, email it to you as well to Mr. Preston. One of the things that really struck me about that is that sometimes the public doesn't understand everything that we have done, which there's a huge amount of education we could do. And not that we want to sit on our laurels. We don't. We want to do things better all the time. But to be able to say there is a huge number of improvements, um, Captain Kunzler, your, your captain, pointed out 29 years ago, he said the condition of that road was a, a, appalling and what to compare to what it is today. So we just really need to give ourselves some credit for the improvements and the attention that we're paying. And I would encourage you when you do your education that that would be a component of it. And then lastly, I just want a quick question and that is, um, and maybe I missed something, but why is it that all of the hours need to be provided as overtime? Uh, it would seem like, I, I understand you're having a challenge in getting additional officers train but it would seem like that would make sense to be able to to do it otherwise so the program is funded through uh, a grant which is used a special code for overtime hours and I don't have the number of officers on a regular day or regular shift to assign to specifically do enforcement on highway 17 I have one officer that works highway 17 on a, on a deployment day so that's really, what, and, and as far as training is concerned, um, we've actually had a gap in new officers in Santa Cruz for the past seven to eight months. We haven't had a new officer, um, which is strange, but uh, we typically get about five new officers every, every six months, but uh, that's slowed down quite a bit. So I don't really, uh, ha I, and I wouldn't know a mechanism to really use funds for just regular salary um, how that would even work. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just for clarification on attachment 2, 28-45, and it's on the, the fund extra CHP enforcement for Highway 17. 
to ensure continuous of the safe on 17 program. Um, it, it has down there, it says, therefore be it resolved by the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission that the executive director and his designee to authorize the safe speed seven, up to 70,000 per year for fiscal year 2018 and 19 and up to 100,000 per year beginning fiscal 2019, 20. Th that's, is that c correct? And is that adding the 50,000 that we're putting up here per year? Uh, that is correct, and that would be adding the, the 50000 if that gets approved by the commission for, so for measure so D funds. So just for clarification, it would be up to 150000 No, it would be uh, it would be up to 100000 a year with the... Uh, so he could he could negotiate up to 100000 a year? He could negotiate up to 100000 a year, yes. And That's, I just wanted to make sure that we... Yeah, and, and, and just to... The, the numbers that were being put out there. Yeah, and just to answer uh, the uh, Commissioner Alternate uh, Schifrin's question earlier about what it would take to get up to the um, original uh, hours, uh, staff did do the analysis and what the inflationary uh, increases have been, and it's been a 65 percent in inflationary increase on the uh, cost of the, you know, per hour of uh, CHP overtime. Uh, so the additional 50,000 hours get you more than what the, the original number of hours uh, um, uh, could uh, uh, be paid for with the with the original fifty thousand dollars, the amount you the um, number of hours you see per year that 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 are actually done in, in overtime by the CHP, uh, it, it does not necessarily correlate to the amount that can be bought by by the funds available because uh, that's uh, actually determined the the amount of uh, overtime that's available by the CHP officers to work during 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 that year. So in some years, uh, not all the money uh, gets used. Uh, but then it gets rolled over to the next, fisc uh, next fiscal year, and then you might have you know, significantly more hours in the next year. So, Commissioner Lowe, you had a comment? Yes, thank you. I um, also appreciate the work that the Safe on 17 group does. I think um, Commissioner Johnson's comments were right on. It is an a a absolute um, great example of collaboration and what can be done. I would just also like to say that in, um, in addition to this, we should not lose sight of the needs to do still some long-range planning and investing in the corridor f for the long term. Um, this, um, there are needs that could be addressed with more investment. I know it's, it's that next level of things in the Regional Transportation Plan that are considered to be currently unconstrained. But we did uh, collaborate with you on a report, I believe it was concluded in 2014, to manage the access points on um, the Santa Cruz side of Highway 17. I know also that District 4, uh, the Cal our Caltrans office um, over the hill, uh, was also looking to, to do some kind of planning work similar to that. So I think we, we still want to keep our um, planning activities alive and moving forward too to the investments that go beyond what we might consider to be the low-hanging fruit. That's an overused term, but this is the, uh, the, the, um, the, the engineering enforcement education is absolutely critical. The degree to which engineering solutions can fix bigger problems are very expensive, but we have to keep our eyes on that too. Uh, Commissioner Rodkin, and I'm going to get to the public. Okay, go ahead. So um, I, I don't want to make it sound like this would be easy because it's not because it's difficult to hire uh, public safety officers for, for all agencies at this point. Um, and it's not like we're just rolling in money that we can just give away and fix, you know, throw at every problem that comes along, but we certainly should investigate the possibility of sending a message to the um, CHP that there might be a potential source of more, you know, dependable funding over the long term, which would allow actually hiring additional officers in addition to this uh, overtime plan. and. Again, that's a planning issue. It's not going to happen this year, maybe not even next, but if you're going to do it ever, you need to start sometime. And so for us to get engaged with the CHP in a discussion about what would it cost, what, what, how much more money would we have to contribute, and how do you, what would be the legal, I mean, the structure in which you would make the contribution into the state budget to make that all happen, but that's something we should be thinking about um, rather than simply saying, well, it's only over time and that's all we can do. I don't think that's smart for us. I think we have to think about a more permanent solution that allows an in increase in the number of officers because <laughs> we won't be distracted driving, but if people are working overtime too much, they're going to have, the officers themselves are going to have problems driving 17. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone from the public like to weigh in on this topic? Okay. I guess the passion of the board didn't flow over <laughs> into the audience. <laughs> but, uh, all right. 
I'll, I'll bring it back for uh, discussion. Uh, let me. Uh, oh, go ahead. You know, uh, this is kind of a quick, uh, fun question. Uh, for those old, o old enough to remember, uh, there used to be a, a gentleman we called the Lone Ranger that would uh, travel back and forth on 17. Yep. Uh, I guess he was a good Samaritan and he would carry flares, uh, he'd give people a jump, yes, uh, he'd give people gas if they ran out. I'm just curious if anybody uh, you know, remember, uh, knows what happened to him. I, I know, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but Mike, you, I'm sure you remember <laughs> him. <laughs> and uh, Lowell, you're probably too young. Uh, so so buggy for me. Yeah. So I don't know, uh, and probably you, uh, that's a long time ago, but he did this on his own time, and I, I don't know if anybody knows what happened to him. It, it stopped. It stopped about five or six years ago. He was doing it up till then, and I don't know why he stopped or what happened, but I actually met him once, really a uh, publicly minded citizen for sure. Yeah. Okay. So now we have the freeway service patrol, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank, uh, right. thank you for clarifying that, okay. Uh, they provide a free service to uh, do all those things. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tow truck. I would move the uh, staff recommendation with an ed uh, couple of added directions. One that we asked staff to uh, coordinate with uh, CHP to do an analysis of uh, additional hours that might be possible and what it would take to support them. And also to ask staff to follow up on Commissioner Rotkin's suggestion of the, the financial implications as well as the bureaucratic in implications of actually having the commission fund an, an additional officer at least um, as a, 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 to be on the, uh, on the highway as their regular assignment. I'll second. Second by a motion by Schiff and second by, uh, by Brown. Um, any other comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Takes us to item uh, 29, uh, Measure D, five-year program for projects for regional projects. Uh, Rachel Morricone, welcome, Rachel. Mr. Chair, before we begin this item, uh, I need to disclose that I have a real property interest between, uh, within 500 feet of segment 11. Um, I know that's a small part of this uh, funding item, um, and this is my very first RTC meeting. I don't know what your protocol here is of whether I should uh, uh, excuse the room as well as recuse myself from well, that lawyer, item. The lawyer is ad nodding that maybe you should. Uh, I think we've had a down. previous commissioner that lived within 500 feet, and so I'm supporting the fact that you need to recuse yourself. Is that correct, Rick? All right. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Sam. Appreciate that. We still have a quorum, correct? <laughs> Good morning, Commissioners. Rachel Morricone of your staff. Before you today is an annual um, action and discussion that we'll have. Um, thankfully, the voters approved Measure D in 2016, which allowed us to address some of the backlog of needs in our community. Today, you are, we are presenting our preliminary recommendations for how to expend Measure D funds over the next five years. You will not actually be taking action on those five-year proposals today. Instead, we're recommending that you um, schedule a public hearing for your June meeting. At that June meeting, we'll go into a little more detail on some of the projects and status of projects. Um, although in your packet, you do have fact sheets on all of the major projects. But today, we really wanted to come to you with the opportunity to look at our preliminary staff recommendations. Let us know, are there things that you want us to investigate similar to um, the prior item, one of the things that is funded by Measure D is the Highway 17, Safe on 17 program. Um, so we'll be looking at your recommendations from that last item as we um, tweak this five-year plan. But this really is the time to, to vet what's before you now so that next month we come forward with our final recommendations. 
So as mentioned before, Measure D is a 30-year half-cent sales tax, um, and so this five-year plan is an opportunity to tell our public, here's how we plan to use the funds in the near term. The um, Measure D included an expenditure plan that provides um, general guidance on how the funds are to be distributed. 25% of the funds go to highway corridors, 17% to active transportation, the Monterey Bay San Cruz Scenic Trail and Rail Trail Program. 7% um, go to the rail corridor, about 20% of the funds go out by formula to the transit district and lift line for um, transportation for seniors and people with disabilities and 30% of the funds go out to local jurisdictions, the cities and the county, for addressing um, needs on the local street and road system. Uh, $5 million of that neighborhood funding is designated for the Highway 17 wildlife crossing, and $10 million of that money is um, designated for projects in San Lorenzo Valley through the Highway 9 corridor. The Regional Transportation Commission is responsible for identifying specific uses and budgeting the funds for about 50% of the total Measure D funds for those regional um, projects and categories. So um, as I mentioned before, next month we will be seeking a commission approval on this. We'll be doing a lot of public outreach. We have a mailing list of over 5,000 people who have expressed interest in keeping track of what's happening with Measure D and these different projects and programs. And so we'll be alerting them to the public hearing. Your advisory committees, the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee, the Bicycle Committee, and the Interagency Technical Advisory Committee all um, previously reviewed these. Uh, preliminary five-year plans and provided some feedback. Um, staff has already integrated those into the five-year plans. So um, today I just wanted to highlight a few of the updates from what was identified before. These are summarized on page two and three of the staff report, but also in attachment one, which are the spreadsheets on the far right column, it shows here's what the updates are for the um, proposed next five years. So a few of the highlights are that for the active transportation program, Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Project, we did re receive a request from the city of Santa Cruz for an additional $1 million to um, implement segment seven, phase two of the rail trail. That is the section that goes from essentially California and Bay intersection down to the wharf. Um, City of Watsonville requested $3.8 million for segment 18. Staff's recommending 2.8 of that $3.8 million, and we'll be working with the City of Watsonville to solicit, use those funds to le leverage other grants and solicit other funds. Um, the County of Santa Cruz has asked for a total of $4 million to do some preliminary engineering and environmental review of segments 10 through 11 and 12 of the rail trail that um, essentially goes from 17th Avenue out to State Park Drive and Aptos Creek Road um, with the exception of the section in the city of Capitola. The city of Capitola is looking at options there. We also have within the rail um, component of the five-year plan an analysis of the trestle bridge through just right here. Um, <laughs> few hundred yards over. Um, in the Highway Corridors plan and in the Highway 9 and the Highway 17 wildlife uh, projects, there are not um, significant changes except for that we have scaled back how much Measure D money we're showing in the five-year plans, and we're going to aggressively go after some new Senate Bill 1 grant programs um, using Measure D funds to leverage those grants, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to cover a significant portion of um, the auxiliary lane projects through Senate Bill 1 grants. We also have added a new item, which is about $100,000 for the Cruise 511 program to s issue a call for projects to some of our partner agencies who provide um, com commuter support and other transportation demand management programs to really encourage people to get out of their cars and use alternatives, especially since it's going to take a few years before we get those auxiliary lanes construction constructed, so, so providing some interim options to provide commuter relief. Um, as mentioned before, we are recommending increasing funds for the Safe on 17 program. The five-year plans before you show that additional $25,000 a year. And then for Highway 9, we are recommending increasing funds for um, the 
one section of roadway um, between Graham Hill Road and the school campus. We're upping the amount of money there to $1 million to hopefully serve as a, a match to leverage some other funds or partner with Caltrans through the State Highway and Operations Protection Program. Um, we've also added a, a tiny bit of funds, $35,000, um, to serve as the funding to the match of a highway safety improvement program grant that we received to make improvements to crossing pedestrian crossings throughout the valley. In the rail program, there are a couple updates, but two major ones are that we did secure an a grant to do an alternatives analysis for um, transit options in the corridor, and we are um, needing to add some funding actually in this fiscal year and there's a budget amendment as part of this item as well to serve as match to that grant and then also to add an additional $150,000 that was needed to finalize all of the work that was done through the Unified Corridor Investment Study. So um, again, today we just are asking for your feedback or if there's any additional items you would like staff to evaluate. Um, we're not looking for a motion on the five-year plans, but we are looking for a motion on the um, public hearing and uh, approval of the resolution. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. We do have the project managers for each of the programs here in the room. And so if you have specific questions on um, highway projects, rail, uh, trail, I might pull them up. Okay, uh, uh, Commissioner Schifrin. I have a process question. Should the commission des uh, des desire to amend the, f the five-year plan over the coming year, What's the process for doing that, if it's possible? Sure, it is possible. The way that the um, ordinance and all of the agreements with local jurisdictions and for any of the funds are set up is that interim amendments can be made. Um, the way our board does it is we typically do it as part of a budget amendment. So it's simply a budget amendment. It's not required to go through a formal public hearing process? It is not for the five-year plan updates. The five-year plan updates we just do one public hearing on, correct? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Brown. Well, I, I just uh, yeah, thank you for that uh, process uh, clarification. Given our experience with the phase one of uh, segment seven, um, it's nice to know that we may, in, in the anticipation of phase two, we, we may be able to um, secure additional funds if necessary. Yep. Commissioner Leopold. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you for this information. I'm grateful for the voters to support Measure D to allow us to have these conversations and um, you can see the impact is broad uh, and extensive uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. I really appreciate the fact sheets that are here um, and I'd love to get individual copies of them uh, because you know we have a 400 page packet you know and just it's hard for people to find these things and I'm, and this would be great to be able to share with the community and uh, you know uh, the estimate estimation here on these fact sheets is that uh, if we're successful at getting grants, which you have shown yourself very successful at getting, uh, we have a very attractive project here. We could have the trail done from the north coast uh, to Aptos um, by 2025. That is pretty incredible. I mean, that, that would be, uh, uh, have a huge impact on our community. Um, and that also includes the, the, the Watsonville segment. So n now that we have, uh, we've uh, adopted a plan, we've gone through the Unified Corridor Study, we have, um, um, uh, we're actually starting the construction, it's really starting to happen. And um, there are naysayers. Um, somebody even said that getting the first part of open was showboat, but uh, the, you, we ha will have miles of this done um, within six years. And that is a great accomplishment. Um, and, um, you know, it's fast for government time. Uh, but it's necessary because, you know, there are some environmentally sensitive things we have to take care of. Uh, a speaker also brought up a uh, concern, and I've heard this before, that the city of Santa Cruz is getting everything and everybody else is left wanting. We hear that a lot. Um, and my mid-county residents have that concern. But yeah, you don't want to build you know, a piece here, a piece there, a piece there. You, you want to start building it so it's continuous. Um, and for me to be able to go out and tell mid-county residents 
that by 2025 we're gonna you're gonna be able to get get on your bike or your or walk from 17th Avenue either to Aptos or up the North Coast on this trail is a great uh, deliverable and will and uh, will really make a difference in the lives of many people um, in Santa Cruz County. We even have a new um, owner on 17th Avenue of a, of a space that is already designing the space to face the, the trail because he knows that uh, it's going to be a plaza, it's going to be a place where people are going to want to uh, congregate and, and take a break as they, as they do the system. So um, this is great information and I'd appreciate if you could just, uh, if we could get, uh, at least my office could get copies of segment uh, eight, nine, and 10, uh, the fact sheets, because we'll include, I'll include that in a future newsletter. Thank you for your work. Any other questions? Commissioner Hurst. Yes, I had uh, seen somewhere, or read somewhere in the uh, report, I think it was in the report, that um, a pedestrian bridge was uh, proposed for uh, Highway 1, and I'm thinking about all the pedestrians that currently cross at uh, Harkin Slough and Highway 1 at this time and how the existing sidewalk is so inadequate that uh, students spill out into the street. And we're, we're talking hundreds, if not a thousand students that are passing through there along with their uh, uh, drivers and, um, and, and the high level of vehicle traffic that exists both in the morning and the afternoon. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what can be done? We, we did have a proposal previously about a pedestrian bridge that might not alleviate some of the motorist congestion, but it might provide a safer passage for students. And if not a bridge, what can be done with the existing overpass to make it more pedestrian and bike friendly? Sure, I can respond to that really quickly, and um, Commissioner Lowe might be able to add to it as well. Um, in partnership with Caltrans, the city of Watsonville has been pursuing the new. Uh, bicycle and pedestrian bridge over Highway 1 at Harkinsley Road. Caltrans is in the environmental review phase right now and is on schedule, I think, to finish that up so that the project could go to construction, I think, in 2022. Um, the Regional Transportation Commission has committed to backfill $6.4 million for that project that unfortunately was deprogrammed in 2016 before we had um, Senate Bill 1 and the CTC was facing severe funding shortfalls because the gas tax was not keeping up with um, the needs and anticipated uh, revenues. So we are, we continue to be a funding partner for that project. Um, we have been working with the city of Watsonville and Caltrans for many years to see that project implemented and I'm pleased that it is moving forward. It's not moving forward with Measure D funds. Measure D did, um, the highway quarters category is a little bit flexible, but the focus of that has been on the pedestrian crossings at Mar Vista in connecting Seacliff and Aptos, as well as on at Chanticleer connecting um, live through Live Oak area. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I just don't want this to fall off the table because it's about safety and uh, uh, p public transit. It is absolutely on the top of our list of things that the commission has committed to funding. Thank you again. Yes. Any other questions? <laughs> Director, would you like to? Yeah, I just wanted to um, let Commissioner Hurst know that the Harkinsloo Bridge was very competitive in the Active Transportation Program grant um, application. Um, um, it did not um, receive funds, but it, it only didn't receive funds because it lost the tiebreaker and that was essentially the fact that it wasn't ready for construction. So um, we did have a very effective meeting yesterday um, with the previous CTC um, executive director and talk about the applications and what they can be done to, to strengthen them. Um, it's important to, to understand all the different funding avenues and strategizing which funds to go after for which projects and we think that um, in a, a subsequent round of the ATP program that the uh, Harkins Slough pedestrian um, overcrossing will probably get funded. If not, we have other avenues to uh, pursue funding for that project. Thank you very much and uh, please keep us posted. Will do. Commissioner Johnson. 
Yeah, I just want to thank the staff for the million dollars for that stretch of um, Highway 9 between Graham Hill and, or, you know, the stretch that you identified. That corridor where all of the, the combined school campuses is very constrained, and it's the number one pedestrian safety corridor. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, the, the city of Watson would also like to thank you for the uh, 2.8 million. Uh, if possibly, if it could be up, that'd be great because it, it is an important part of the, the segment 18 for us uh, to get our trails going for our bicyclists and our students, and, and make it a, a safer access for some of our students to access Poplar Valley High, and also for those folks who want to do commute from the South County to Mid County, uh, it, that would be a great connection for us. Commissioner Cap. Thank you. I, I guess uh, I, that's the only uh, question I'm focused on right now is uh, the city requested 3.8 million and then we come back with this figure of 2.8 million. How did that come about? I mean, uh, we didn't just pick a number out of the, out of the air, right? Sure. Uh, a major goal of Measure D is to use Measure D funds as seed money to leverage other grants. And so we believe in other funds and ensure that local jurisdictions also provide funding into projects as well. And so we believe that it would be feasible to go after um, some, uh, some grants or for the city to also look at its own Measure D share of funds and, and consider contributing funds to the project similar to other jurisdictions and I, I know we have pressure from uh, the federal government uh, funding and everything and state funding um, with measure D it was uh, passed by two-thirds of the voters so that money cannot be taken and being used <coughs> for something else is that correct very true and that's one of the best that's one correct. of the key reasons that we needed measure D was to know that we have some stable funding coming in that's the importance mm -hmm. of uh, having a specific rather than general uh, tax. Uh, and there is pressure because uh, the federal highway and all that is uh, threatening to withhold money from California. So th we're, we're not going to take this money for these specific projects in order to fund some of the other projects that are not going to be funded by the federal government. I am optimistic that the federal government will maintain its existing commitments that we've already, for projects that we've already funded. Right. Okay. Um, and then it was, it was, the question was asked earlier, we can amend this later or should we, um, can we amend it now? Today would be the opportunity for commissioners to identify if there are different things that you would like us to evaluate as part of the five-year plan. You would then approve the five-year plans in June and then if after June, between June and June 2020, you want to make some other modifications, you could ask staff to um, look into those and, and bring forward any okay, changes. I'd, uh, I'd ask, I, get, I don't know if it would be an amendment, but uh, to look at, and I, it was also mentioned doing it piece by piece, and uh, I know that that doesn't connect uh, the city necessarily with the part we have in the unincorporated areas, but that would be the ideal thing if we could connect everything. But we want to make sure the cities, Santa Cruz, Capitola, and uh, Scotts Valley and Watsonville get their money to get their projects done. So I would say I would like to look at the Watsonville $2.8 million being raised to uh, uh, anywhere between $3.8 million and what they're requesting. <laughs> I'd like to let the executive director weigh in. So um, I wanted to um, respond somewhat to uh, Commissioner Cabot's <coughs> questions and concerns. Um, <coughs> uh, Rachel made a very good point with respect to leveraging additional fund sources. Um, if you also look at the five-year programming uh, recommendation that was put forward, um, we actually have more projects programmed than we have funding available. Um, we, we, that made me nervous um, in doing so, but one of the things that I've seen is that it's very hard for projects to um, meet their delivery schedules. We also looked at um, Watsonville's request and noticed that it was several years out, and it, you made a good point in that this could be amended in future years. So um, we felt that 
programming a little bit less than the full amount requested would um, provide incentive for um, looking for grant opportunities so we can make this money stretch as far as possible. But there will also be a, another um, opportunity next year to, uh, to redo the five-year plans. There will also be opportunities for amendments between now and then so that um, the amounts th that are recommended to be programmed today could be changed at a later time based on how well those projects do in funding grant opportunities. So it shouldn't necessarily be looked at as if the 2.8 million is an absolute and that's all that will be received by Watsonville for this particular project but an opportunity to try to see if we could uh, stretch that money a little bit further. And if not, um, we would certainly be um, receptive to um, reprogramming if, if needed to deliver the project. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I guess I, I do understand that. But I, 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 I want to make sure we get that segment in the Watsonville, you know, done. So I, I can say in my amendment, and, uh, Right now, uh, my amendment would be that we make it, uh, we're up to th uh, 3 million, not 3.8 million. And then uh, that's a little bit more f than put in there, but also it uh, does offer some incentive. So uh, that would be my amendment uh, that we at least were arguing for 3 million uh, up to 3.8 million instead of 2.8 million. Commissioner Schiffer. I, I would need a second on that, right? So okay. we're actually not taking amendments and, and, motion. and motions yeah. today. You're just providing feedback, and staff will take that and into consideration as we develop our final okay, staff do recommendations. I need a second on that? These are suggestions. These are yeah. just suggestions. Today, you are not taking action on the five year plans. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Schiffer, and then I'll get to you. I think it's important to remember that these are goal setting. Uh, in terms of allocating a limited amount of money, there's only a certain percentage that can go for this function. And the commission staff has been very active in trying to identify a variety of funding sources to make that, uh, co that measure D commitment go as far as it could. To do the entire, to, to reach Commissioner Leopold's goal of having a, 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 a completed trail by 2025 is going to take a lot of money and it's not just going to be measure D money. The jurisdictions are going to have to put in money as the city of Santa Cruz is putting money into it, the projects within its area and the other jurisdictions are going to have to put in money as well. Plus there's other grants out there at the state level, maybe at the federal level that can be applied for. So I think my sense of it is um, the staff approach is a reasonable approach in terms of saying based on where these projects are at this time this makes sense as an allocation when the projects get ready to actually go to bid and be done we want the projects done and moving them along to the point where they can be constructed and then having to deal with maybe we'll be lucky and the price will be less than what we like maybe we won't be lucky and the price will be higher than we like and then we have to look at what is the funding available to build the project so from my perspective, there's a commitment to build uh, all of the segments. The Watsonville segment is moving forward as quickly as it moves forward and it's ready to go. I think the commission will cooperate, will be supportive, of, at least I'll be supportive of cooperating with the city of Watsonville to make sure there's significant money. But I think there is a, you know, the, the city council and the the city staff have to th appreciate the fact that there needs to be an internal commitment as well. It's not just Measure D, because Measure D has to go a long way if it's going to really fulfill the goal of providing the entire trail. So, I, you know, I don't know what the funding mix is now. Um, I think that each of, the pr each of the segments need to move along as quickly as they can, looking for the outside grants, looking for the jurisdictional commitments, and looking for the Measure D funds and, and finding that correct match. You bet. I, uh, but, I'd, I'd like to weigh in for a second. Before we territorialize what's going on here, um, I think I want to commend staff for, for making an effort to uh, allocate $2.8 million of a $3.8 million project. That's a significant uh, investment into a project. I believe we're sending a strong message that that's a priority project. 
I also want to go back to the presentation we had earlier from our public works director who showed some of the projects in Capitola. And as you can see, it showed, uh, the breakdown showed that some was paid by SB1, some was paid by Measure D, some was paid by the city. And I think the message that the director has sent us is by allocating 2.8, we're providing incentive to look for these other grants, as Rachel seems optimistic we can get. And there is a portion there that we expect individual jurisdictions to uh, contribute themselves. And, and even though I'm not, wouldn't be generally opposed to bumping up that number as, uh, as uh, Commissioner Caput suggested, I, I keep in mind that every time we take $200,000 and put it someplace, we take it away from someplace else. <laughs> So I want to make sure we don't get into that, that game where we are fighting against each other. I would like to think that the staff has made a recommendation that this project is a priority project by seeding it with $2.8 million. So with that, I'll go to uh, Commissioner Hurst. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I, I fully agree with your uh, comments there and understand the, the, the takeaway and uh, giveaway uh, aspects of the budget. But this uh, project is particular is uh, needed and necessary. And, and, uh, and the current need is that thousands <coughs> of high school students could be utilizing a trail in addition to the general public that could uh, uh, easily walk uh, from uh, the urbanized area of Watsonville to the land trust property for public access and students can uh, quite easily move on to the high school as well. So it's, the need is already there, it's pretty clear this is a wonderful opportunity. I just want to reinforce uh, Supervisor Caput's uh, concept and uh, goal and, and desire that this uh, th that we move this seg segment 18 forward as uh, as most rapidly as we can. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, yeah, uh, just a quick comment. And, and like I said, uh, City of Watsonville uh, thanks you for the 2.8 million dollars, and, and they are looking into for, to for grants and for their uh, funding. Uh, but it also is a priority for us in South County to develop this rail trail system uh, to give access, especially to our, st our students, because I, 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 my heart goes out to all those folks out in uh, Felton and the, and the student that was, the, that was lost on Highway 9. We, we shouldn't be waiting until we have major accidents and, and fatalities like that to take action. So again, I, I thank the RTC for their, their action on this. But I would also like to ask uh, the, uh, staff to come to the City of Watsonville and make a presentation um, on this, and so with that, I, I thank you for your time. I think that's a great suggestion. C Commissioner Rodkin. Uh, just two comments. Mm -hmm. um, first on this one, I think people have said most of the things that, that, that I would say about it. I, I think it would be different if the staff were saying you can get 2.8 and then good luck. What they're saying is 2.8 and here's a whole strategy for how we'll get the rest. And when you go out and ask for grants, one of the things that you do is you show we have this need, we're matching it, overmatching it, we're not asking for like, you know, 80% of it. We're asking for a smaller percentage of it. And you're more likely to get those grants if, in fact, you don't have been funding some larger part of it yourself. So I'm not s persuaded that this project will benefit necessarily. And again, it's several years out where you actually need that extra additional money and you have opportunities to do it. And we, we, we might be persuaded of that in two years, and I'm not persuaded of it right now, just so you understand that. My other comment's not related to this issue, but it's on the thing we're dealing with. Someone in the public talked about how, you know, Trump's trying to withhold money, the gov federal government's trying to withhold money from California. And believe me, I would be happy to jump on any opportunity to blame the president for everything going on. But I was recently at a lobbying trip for the, uh, re uh, for the uh, transit district in Washington, D.C., looking for transit money for our district as well as for the, the country in terms of uh, public transit and public transportation. And what's really clear is that despite the president's bluster about how he's going to punish California and so forth, that's not really our biggest threat. The biggest threat is that there's simply not enough money in the federal government to fund all the projects that people want funded out there. That's an issue for Congress and the president. And I'm afraid it's a little dismal because they might have about six months to actually do the work on renewing the um, funding for public transit for the next five years, there's a, there's a, that's a slight window of opportunity because after six months we're in an election and nobody's going to vote to raise the gas tax in the middle of, a, uh, of an election. So whether we're going to be able to do that or not, I think our problem is getting the federal government to turn around and face the reality that we need public support for moving people in America. And because right now, the, it's not the rhetoric of punishing California, it's the rhetoric of why should the federal government be in the transportation business that's frightening me. 
And so I think we really have to think about how we're going to lobby not just the President but Congress about the critical importance of getting a – we haven't increased the gas tax since 1993, and it's in crisis. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff I won't spend the time this morning to get into. But I think that's where we should need to be focusing our energy is on getting the federal government to step up and recognize its traditional responsibility for helping America move around. That, and that rhetoric is scaring me a lot more than whether they are or are not going to try and punish California. I didn't get a sense from the administration people in the Federal Transit Administration, for example, that they are in any way involved in this punish California concept. What they are telling us is they're ten times oversubscribed for the federal funding that they've got to go out into transit, and that's a serious problem for us. Well, can I just add, uh, uh, I will give you proof that they are targeting California. They have denied $6 million worth of uh, disaster relief requests at the Federal Highway Administration already for the County of Santa Cruz, and in six months we're in danger of losing $35 million uh, uh, because of the Trump administration's effort to block California getting disaster aid. So uh, that's not to, that's not to disagree with anything my colleague said, but this administration is targeting California and is denying money to Santa Cruz County right now. Okay. For Thank roads. you. Thank you for those comments. I, I'd like to go ahead and open it up to the public now. If anybody would like to weigh in on this topic, now's the time. All right, people, it's trail now. Um, in 2012, this is an example of the showboating. You did showboating. Mr. Leopold, then you said we were gonna, we're, we've already got the trail and we're already building it. Well, we haven't physically built anything. The reason why we're not building anything, segment segment is a great example. You had to break it up because it was too expensive. It's that million dollars you want to throw at segment seven, phase two, it's still not enough. This is our argument, you guys. You're wasting, you're sitting there complaining about not having enough money. In the meantime, you're trying to spend to build your trail, to design a trail for a future train. That's our problem. You're trying to design, you're spending money to design a system for a future train that you can't afford. So why are you spending all those millions for that? Segment seven is a great example. No, you haven't done anything. Segment 18 at Wazaville, that was supposed to be done years ago. It's been sitting there. Um, I'm sorry, and that's why the CTC is questioning your what you guys are doing. It's so you know, and you're you're really taking going off and design spending money to design a trail f today to accommodate a future train is taking away from where we need to spend the money. This isn't all kumbaya, you, you, you know, the showboating, it really is a word that should be used more often when I come in here. I hear you, Mr. Leopold, be showboating direct that we're your building. To direct your comments to the board in general. Please don't pick on individual commissioners. Thank you. All right. We operate as one unit. I know you do. Anyways, um, so let me give a little bit of history of the Measure D. It was originally had a significant million dollars going to the train. We opposed it. Zach Friend, Don Lane adjusted it because they knew that it wouldn't pass if they had the train. They had the Monterey train station. They had millions going towards the train because the public doesn't want the train. You saw that with Measure L. Okay? I know, Guy, you came in here saying you're going to collaborate and shift, but you haven't done anything. You're sh continuing uh, with the train goal. That's the direction, and the community was against that with Measure D, and that's why we had the Zach and them adjusted the language. They took Monterey train station out. So as you continue to spend money designing a trail for a future train, that's essentially spending money for a train because you're spending, wasting a lot of money. And segment seven is a great example. Yeah, give the million dollars to Santa Cruz. It's still not enough. It's still not enough. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this? Welcome. Good morning. Christian Eider, uh, City of Santa Cruz Public Works Department. Just wanted to um, express our need for the million dollars for Segment 7, Phase 2. Uh, that matches a million for the City of Santa Cruz Measure D, and the intent is to apply for a grant this summer that's going to be available. The project cost is about $10 million. 
Um, we've recently gone to the Planning Commission for, and they've approved the permits for the project. It's been um, appealed by a couple of individuals to the City Council, and that's intending to go this month or next month. Um, also, the first um, segment of the rail trail is under construction, and that's the San Lorenzo River Trestle Walkway. Um, it is uh, actually ahead of schedule. Uh, the likelihood is it's going to be open to the public on May 17th. Uh, originally, it was May 24th. The contractor's done a great job in uh, picking up speed on the project with the better weather, and um, it's uh, going to be open before the summer season. Uh, phase segment seven, phase one, that project's getting ready to bid this summer, and hopefully with everything going as anticipated, be under construction in the fall. Thank you very much. Great. Oh, one other project, segment eight and nine. Uh, we are working with the County of Santa Cruz on that project, which is a joint project. Um, the city um, took the lead on the application for the uh, grant that's paying for the environmental review and design with obviously the help of the land trust to match the grant, not measure D at this point. And uh, that should be going out and be circulated this summer as well. So hopefully we'll start working on that project next fall as well. Thank you. Thanks for the update. Hi, Sally Arnold, Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, we are uh, very excited about the progress being made on the rail and trail. and. We've been talking amongst ourselves, kind of looking at these sections and like how, you know, link them together. We're, we're like, the, oh my gosh, in two years, we're going to be able to bike from the east side over that trestle through segment seven out Wilder, and we'll be able to get to Wilder car free. And then in another, we're thinking, you know, three years, maybe to Davenport. And, you know, now that we hear there's these things going south, south county and mid county, it's very exciting. It, um, when the fact that the city of Santa Cruz and the county and Watsonville are all applying to for funds to build segments in their jurisdictions is really indicative of the countywide enthusiasm for this project. And I have to say, we do, we've been doing a lot of tabling this spring at public events like um, the Earth Day in Watsonville and in Santa Cruz. And when we're there, the most often heard thing we say is, what's taking so long? When will we get my segment? And um, I see that these allocations spread as they are throughout the county is your response to that question. You know, your segment is coming soon. And I'm just very excited um, about the diversity of projects and you know, kind of like stringing these beads together on a chain and pretty soon we're gonna have a beautiful trail across the whole county. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Okay, anyone else from the public? <coughs> Bring it back for discussion. I would move the staff recommendation on this item with the added direction that staff provide a presentation on Measure D funding to the City Council of Watsonville. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Shipper and second by Johnson. Any other additional comments? With that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Ah, Commissioner Story, welcome back. Okay, that takes us to item 30 of uh, Measure D, Community Bridges Lift Line's five-year plan. Grace Blakely, welcome. Thank you. Um, good afternoon now, commissioners. I'll be brief. 20% um, of the Measure D revenues are designated for transit and seniors and people living with disabilities, and 4% of the revenues are allocated to the Consolidated Transportation Services Air Agency, which is um, Community Bridges Lift Line for Santa Cruz County. Paratransit services, as we talked about earlier, as part of the unmet needs, increased transportation options for seniors and individuals living with disabilities and persons with low incomes. Liftline will receive an average at $855,000 per year during the period of this five-year plan, as shown in attachment one. It's a correction in the staff report. It referred to it as attachment two, and it's attachment one. 32% um, will f go to support two new driver positions to provide door-to-door -door service. 9% um, is for a new van driver trainer who will supervise van drivers and provide all phases of training for drivers. 8% goes to an administrative assistant to support these programs as well as a dispatcher. A, a small portion, 1%, is provided for outreach um, to provide materials and videos to promote paratransit rides through LiftLine. 
46% is for an operations and facility reserve to purchase property and construct an operations facility, and 4% for vehicle and equipment res uh, reserve to purchase two new fleet vehicles. Um, all of these investments address items that are on the unmet um, paratransit and transit needs list. Community Bridges Lift Line is the only agency receiving a direct allocation of Measure D funds that is not a public agency. So review and approval of their Measure D five-year plan is overseen by the Regional Transportation Commission and included in the RTC's public review process. Kirk Ants from Community Bridges is here to pr um, answer any questions, detailed questions that you may have on their five-year plan. It's very similar to the five-year plan that was presented by them last year. Staff is just recommending, like in your previous item, that you provide input and that you schedule a public hearing um, for to consider approval of this plan in your June RTC meeting. Thank you, Grace. Any questions of the uh, five-year plan? All right. I guess we have no questions. We'll wait for the uh, public hearing. Does it uh, something you'd like to add? Um, uh, yes, I'd like to add a little bit. And uh, Kirk Hans again from Liftline. And I wanted to go over the five-year plan, some of the highlights, and thank the commissioners for um, the funding so far, the RTC. We've uh, done great things with, with the funds so far. And just like uh, uh, Grace had gone over the different uh, projects that we have and the percentage, uh, percentages allocated to them, uh, so I'd just add some highlights. Uh, one of the highlights so far for this fiscal year is our extended service. Uh, we do provide transportation seven days a week. Us mostly weekend is uh, subcontracted with taxi right now um, because of our availability with drivers. We're struggling a little bit hiring new drivers. We were kind of up and then we're down again, so it kind of moves up and down. The good thing about the driver trainer is he can act as a backup driver to keep the services going. And with the uh, expanded uh, services, we've uh, put on schedule to provide 6,000 additional um, medical rides this uh, this fiscal year. One of the other highlights is we're uh, able to uh, work with the Downtown Seniors Center and we provide transportation to their activities with major D funds. So that's uh, classes like uh, Tai Chi, dancing, uh, gentle yoga, computer, reading, things of those nature. And it helps support the isolation and, and loneliness as well. And then from there they usually I enjoy the meals from Meals on Wheels. One of the other highlights is the um, we were able to leverage a <coughs> uh, CARB grant as uh, executive director from the RTC had, had mentioned and gone over the details. Um, we had our kickoff event last Friday and uh, many of you were there. I see a lot of familiar faces from the commission, the RTC and the city of Watsonville as well as uh, uh, CARB was there, Ecology Action, and some members from the community that promote uh, electrical vehicle use. Uh, we had our ribbon cutting event. We thought it was a, a, a great event, uh, but we were able, with the funds that we were leveraged, we'll be getting two brand new 16 passenger fully electric buses uh, equipped with wheelchairs. Each vehicle will have two wheelchair positions, and we have uh, two charging uh, stations capable of um, charging uh, four vehicles simultaneously at our Ford facility, on Ford Street facility in Watsonville, which is open to the public, the, the chargers during our operation hours there. And um, another thing I'd like to highlight is uh, operations facility, um, which was a, a huge issue on the met, on met needs list. We have now are in escrow for an operations facility, which is in the disadvantaged uh, community uh, area of Santa Cruz County in Watsonville. And it's, uh, we're not going to disclose the location yet because we still got some contingencies to remove. But as soon as we get all that done and get our permits from Watsonville, we'll share all that great information and hopefully it all works smooth. Um, when I was meeting with the RTC and we're going over on that needs list a couple years ago, we were talking about the size of the facility and uh, we came up with uh, two acres to build a facility, but this turned out to be exactly what we're looking for. It's just a little over two acres and it already has a building on it that is adequate and meets our needs both operational wise with staff and with uh, the maintenance shop and the fleet parking. So it covers all that we need and we'll also be moving infrastructure there for charging as well. 
And uh, if we have some other great and upcoming things that uh, we'll keep you posted with the Measure Defense in the future. Thank, thank you for that presentation. Questions Any questions? Uh, Director Hurd. Yeah. Perhaps uh, Kurt could tell us how does one qualify to be able to ride on one of these uh, very slick and, and modern okay. electric buses? So uh, currently um, there is a application process that we have our application online on our website or it can be um, taken from our uh, office, picked up at our office and it's, it's <coughs> low income so there's proof of income, age or disability. Uh, <coughs> other services are contracted with us such as Meals on Wheels and Elder Day where we have a direct contract so if you're part of those programs you'll get the uh, transportation. Same with the Downtown Seniors Council if you're uh, going to one of those activities so there's some activities already kind of uh, built in there. So. And can you give the public uh, a little idea of what the income qualification looks so like? So the income qualification is 200% uh, below the poverty level um, currently to qualify. And I dollar amount, uh, I don't have a chart with me, but I, uh, I think that's about 20,000 a year. So it's qu quite low. Or it might be a little higher than that, but I'm sorry, I can't answer that right Close now. Close enough. Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner Story. Thank you. Um, to begin, con congratulations on your new operations yeah, facility. You, uh, I know it's a sorely needed uh, yeah. uh, infrastructure for lift line. Um, on the unmet needs, uh, public outreach, there were comments made about uh, out of county medical transportation needs. I wonder. Um, are you uh, now able to provide that service or is there still a gap there? Yeah, great question. Uh, we are able to provide those services, which again was a result of the unmet uh, needs list that helped us get the funding, help us prove the need with uh, Caltrans 5310 funding. We were awarded a grant for um, about 550000 for a three year period and half of that money goes to the out-of-county transportation. So uh, we're our one year into it, so we have about a year and a half left. Um, in the future, we plan on rolling that into Measure D funded when the funding runs out from Caltrans. So hopefully there's no gaps in between the time that we can do that. Uh, if you look at attachment A that shows our five-year plan in the year, um, 23, 24, we add an additional driver, and that's taking part of that into consideration that we keep those most needed rides that are on the unmet needs list that we focus on those. So as that funding, if that funding runs out and we can't get it again from Caltrans, then we will use Measure D funds to keep the, the out of county in the same day operating. Thank Good, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Commissioner Brown. Say this is all really great news, and um, just wanted to also <coughs> thank you for all of your work to provide low-income uh, individuals, uh, disabled and, and seniors, individuals with critical transit access. So, so thank you for your report and the history work. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you for that presentation. We'll see you back again. Anyone from the public like to weigh in on this? Seeing no one, we'll bring it back for a recommendation. Move a staff recommendation. Second. Mo motion by Rotkin. Second by was that Schifrin? Yes. Yeah, motion. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Takes us to uh, item 31, 2045 Regional Transportation Plan, Environmental Impact Report. Grace. Okay. Grace Blakesley, good afternoon. Um, the Regional Transportation Commission is responsible for developing and implementing and regularly updating the Regional Transportation Plan. The purpose of the Regional Transportation Plan is to establish regional goal, identify present and future needs, deficiencies and constraints, look at solutions, estimate available funding and propose investments and projects. Um, to do this, the Regional Transportation Plan is made up of a policy element, an action element and a financial element. Um, the RTP is a state mandated plan that is required to receive federal and state funding. The guidelines are developed by the California Transportation Commission. There was an update to the guidelines in 2017, but the updates are m made minor changes. Um, the current RTP projects and transportation needs um, and available funding is identified through 2040 and was adopted by the Regional Transportation Commission in 2018. 
The next re regional transportation plan will project out to 2045 and will again estimate how much funding will be available for Santa Cruz County to invest in transportation projects from now until 2045. It will also include a list of transportation projects that address the transportation uh, needs of Santa Cruz County residents and this makes up the action element um, portion of the regional transportation plan. That project list, as a Commissioner mentioned earlier, is divided into two categories. Um, they're co referred to as the constrained and the unconstrained list. Um, those projects that are expected to be fully or partially funded are included on the constrained list, and those that would require new funding are listed on the unconstrained list. Um, the regional transportation plan projects um, do need to undergo a separate environmental and, and design process and can only implement be implemented when this local and state and federal funding is programmed to them. Um, the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan is incorporated into the Metropolitan Transportation Plan and the state mandated sustainable community strategy that's developed by the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. Um, the proposed work plan for the 2045 Regional Transportation Plan is included as attachment one. Um, this update of the RTP will be supported by an update to the public participation plan, which was last aided, updated in 2015, and includes strategies for engaging the public in the transportation planning process. Um, the update is led by the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments with input from the Regional Transportation Commission. Other tasks um, in development of the RTP involved seeking approval and considering updates to the policy element. As noted in the work plan, RTC staff is not expecting to undertake a major policy element update for the 2045 RTP. The existing policies were developed primarily as part of development of the 2012 RTP and focus on sustainable transportation. Um, where appropriate policies may be updated to include information from recent transportation studies or other priorities. With regards to um, performance measurement, um, RTC staff expects to provide updated information about how Santa Cruz County's transportation system is currently performing um, since the 2040 RTP adoption in a way that reflects standard practice for transportation um, performance monitoring. Um, when looking at the plan performance and the projections, the expectation is that the Santa Cruz County RTP will refer to projections primarily made through the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments for the 2045 update. Um, in addition, the RTP will update the action element, that project list, and we will work with all the project sponsors to see if new projects need to be included or priorities have changed and bring that information to the Regional Transportation Commission. And as part of that, there's an update to the financial element, which looks at the um, changes in any funding projections and funding availability through the 2045 timeframe. Um, the, an environmental impact report is completed as part of this process and is combined with the environmental impact report for the Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy. It's a programmatic document which presents a region-wide assessment of potential impacts on the physical environment and identifies strategies to avoid or mitigate those impacts. As in the past three cycles, um, AMBAG, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, will be the lead agency under CEQA, and the RTC will serve as a responsible agency as part of this um, environmental impact report. RTC staff works closely with AMBAG to review and provide comments. Um, but RTC, the RTC will um, need to adopt the CEQA findings prior to approving the RTP as a project. And today we're here to recommend that you authorize staff to coordinate with AMBAG on the development of the 2045 Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy and to coordinate with and enter into a cost sharing agreement with them in the amount of $60,000 for development of this report. Any questions for Ms. Blakesley? None? Okay. Anyone from the public like to weigh in on this? Okay, none, bring it back for a recommendation. This is a staff recommendation. Second. Motion by Rodkin, second by Schifrin for recommended action. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Negative. I thought motion Hernandez was bad. <laughs> that motion carries unanimously. <laughs> okay, it takes item 32, a review of items to be discussed in closed session. Uh, Mr. Mendez. Uh, yes, you have uh, two items scheduled for closed session today. This is uh, a litigation session. This is Conference of Legal Counsel anticipated litigation uh, s with significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9D. D 
two. That's one case, and also with um, uh, pursuant to government code section five four nine five six point nine D four. Also one case. Thank you, Brooke. Do we expect to report anything out from this? No, we don't. Okay, with that, um, we'll be holding the uh, closed session in this room, so I'll ask you to uh, expedite. Just want to make a quick announcement that the next meeting of the RTC will be Thursday, June 6th at uh, 9 a.m. in the city of Watsonville. And uh, the next TPW workshop is scheduled for Thursday, June 20th at the RTC offices. And thank you, uh, and if you could help uh, expedite the room, we can get on with the closed session. Thank you.